Hi, Lucas. Hi, Marcos. Hi. Hi. We have about two minutes, and then it's your turn. All right, I see Ms. Grijalva here. I see Ms. Counts, Mr. Burke. So it looks like we have, I'm looking for Ms. Sedwick. There's Ms. Sedwick, Gordon. Okay, Michelle, could we have a roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Counts? It's hard to hear you. Can you say yeah. that a little bit louder? Ms. Counts? Here. Ms. Grijalva? Here. Ms. Sedwick Gordon? Here. Mr. Berg? Here. Ms. Foster? Here. Ms. Foster? I'm here too, so I think we have five board members. So we have a quorum, and we will call our meeting to order. And next up is agenda adjustments. Oh no, we do the pledge and then that. Okay, so I have two of my favorite people. I took a uh, a point of privilege to invite friends of mine, Lucas and Marcos Albaran. Lucas and Marcos are students at what school? Where do you guys go to school? Davis. Davis. And Marcos, what grade are you in? First. And how old are you? Six. Six. And then Lucas, how about you? I, I'm in third grade and I'm eight. And I've been on the board eight years. And that just kind of blows my mind, my dear, that the year you were born is when I started all of this on the school board. So that to me is just like, you're so symbolic for me of all every year I've been on the board is every year you've been with us here in Tucson. And that's really, really special. And so I thank you for joining us this evening. I, I wanna see if your teachers are here. I know we invited them. Is Senora Torres here? Is it Senor Barcelo? And Senor Barcelo, is he here? No, don't see him. You don't see them? I don't see their names. If they, if they turn on, maybe they're here. There's so many people. It's kind of hard to tell if they're here. Let me give them a moment. Maybe they didn't join us. So it's all you guys. Are you ready for this? They're going to show us a flag. Are you ready? <laughs> And we're going to stand up and you're going to start us with the pledge. Ready? Here we go. As soon as you've seen the flag. One, two, three. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands for the nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, that's the fastest we've ever done, and you guys are. <laughs> Thank you. Lucas, Marcos, give your mom and dad a big hug and kiss for me, OK? Bye. 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 Thank you. Wait, that was it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. They're so special to me. They're like nephews. OK, Dr. Trujillo, agenda adjustments. Yes, President Foster, I would like to recommend item 9.4. We have some guests from the census, from the U.S. Census, uh, to thank the board tonight for its support of uh, promoting the census here in TUSD. I'd like to recommend we move them up directly after call to the audience. All right. Any others? That works for me right after call to the audience, item 9.4. Okay. Sounds good. Dr. Trujillo, superintendent's report item 3.1. Yes, we have kind of a packed superintendent's report this evening. So because this is the only meeting in December, we're going to be doing awards and recognitions first, then the business portion of the superintendent's report. And finally, a very special portion of the superintendent's report dedicated to the departure of our three governing board members who proudly take the dais tonight for the final time uh, in their respective tenures. So we'll first begin with our awards and recognitions and I will do my share screen. We do want to start with the TUSD School Garden Network, 2020 Arizona Association for Environmental Education 
Excellence in Environmental Education Award winning program. TUSD School Garden Network awarded the 2020 uh, Association for Environmental Excellence in Environmental Education Award for having a significant impact on environmental education in the state of Arizona. Long noted as being one of TUSD's marquee programs, uh, TUSD School Garden Network demonstrates outstanding action, contribution, and leadership, uh, supporting environmental education through initiatives and enthusiastic implementation of environmental education programs across the district. So we certainly congratulate all of our hardworking team members that make the SD School Garden Network the amazing program that it is. Uh, we want to thank Lerner and Rowe, the injury attorneys, for their Thanksgiving Fest giveaway, uh, an absolutely heartwarming act of kindness on behalf of our attorney partners in the community. On November 1st, uh, Family Resource Center and the Educational Enrichment Foundation provided 250 hams and gift cards to TUSD families as a result of the generosity of our friends at Lerner and Rowe. Thank you to Lerner and Rowe for this, this generous donation to the Educational Enrichment Foundation, who partnered with us to ensure many of our families received a little something special to make their Thanksgiving unforgettable. And here you can see our hardworking uh, staff members putting those hams uh, to work and distributing them out there in the community. Special thank you also to our Family Resource Center employees that came out on their own time uh, to distribute the hams and to interact with our community members. Just such a generous act of kindness and service that, of course, typifies what makes TUSD so special here in the county. And a special thank you to current uh, Buffalo Bills player, but more importantly, TUSD and Tucson Magnet High School alumni Mr. Levi Wallace, currently at the Buffalo of the NFL's Buffalo Bills on November 21st, African American Student Services provided 100 food boxes with canned and dry goods. Uh, in addition to the 100 food boxes, another 30 families received a turkey. The Thanksgiving food boxes uh, was a collaborative project with Tucson High with the with the Tucson High graduate and current. Uh, NFL Buffalo Bills player, Levi Wallace. Mr. Wallace gave a generous donation to African-American Student Services through the Educational Enrichment Foundation to support the 100 food boxes, along with $5,000 to purchase $150 Walmart gift cards. The collaborative giving event also involved our TUSD Palo Verde High School Family Resource Center staff, uh, local African-American fraternities, sororities, organizations, and churches. In addition, Mr. Wallace has generously donated 465 hams to provide to families for the winter holidays beyond Thanksgiving. These will be provided with our food services weekly meal boxes at our drive through pickup prior to winter break. Levi wanted to provide food for the holidays to families in our community. And uh, Levi is also committed to serving as our Zoom keynote speaker for our African-American Student Services Department event in February. Thank you, Levi. Such a great example of one of our amazing alumni coming back and serving the community. And I've received a lot of emails, so my answer is no, Mr. Wallace was not playing in the end zone on Sunday when DeAndre Hopkins caught the Hail Mary pass against the Buffalo Bills. Yes, he does play in the secondary but he was not active that game. So I also want to thank uh, Lindsay Aguilar for her team's wonderful support, uh, putting Mr. Wallace's generosity into action by making sure that all of our weekly meal boxes include uh, his generous uh, donation. We look forward to welcoming Levi back to the friendly confines of the TUSD community when he appears at our event in February. And here's some great pictures of our Thanksgiving event. Uh, thank you again to African American Student Services Department for coming out on the weekend and making this a memorable Thanksgiving for so many of our families. Tucson Quilters Guild, thank you. 
Kate Verbicki, Shelly Whitman, and Kathy Willis. The Tucson Quilters Guild donated an additional 250 handmade fabric facial coverings. They have provided over a thousand to date uh, to the employees and the families of the Tucson Unified School District since the beginning of this pandemic. These amazing community members have gone above and beyond in trying to do everything possible to make sure that our community and our district are safe for all. So we certainly give them a round of applause. And our Stuff the Bus event this past weekend at the Walmart located off of Speedway and, and Cobb was a smashing success. This was a collaborative effort with the African American Student Services and Booth Thicket K-8 Communities. Assistant Superintendent Bryant Lambert agreed to be the Santa Claus. I believe that is Brian uh, there, uh, stepping away from his duties as our hardworking regional assistant superintendent to don the Santa suit. So thank you, Mr. Lambert, for coming out and making that a memorable event. Uh, we also enlisted the help of African-American fraternities and sororities as community partners and stakeholders. We received over a thousand toys and clothes, which will be distributed to students in need Families and students were thrilled to see us. We greatly appreciate the support of the Tucson community in this absolutely wonderful event. So thanks again to uh, Mr. Hart and the hardworking folks of our African-American Student Services Department. Those Stuff the Bus events are awesome. They are hallmark events uh, for the department each and every single year and they're memorable for our students. So that concludes our board our superintendent recognition. I will now move to our superintendent's report, which I will bring up momentarily. President Foster, members of the governing board, a couple of key items to brief uh, all of you board members and the community on uh, with regard to happenings around the district uh, this week of December 7th. Uh, first, a quick update on our second semester. Uh, realizing we need to bring clarity, communication uh, in a timely fashion as quickly as possible, I wanna communicate here this evening, I will not be recommending an opening of uh, hybrid or in-person learning on January 4th. Uh, TUSD will be opening up the second semester on January 4th fully online. At this particular time, I have no identified start date uh, for the return of in-person learning or hybrid instruction. Right now, currently, COVID-19 transmission uh, throughout Pima County is at the category of widespread. We will continue to work with the Pima County Health Department Arizona Department of Health Services. We will also be watching very closely uh, what our uh, Board of Supervisors does at Pima County, as well as our City Council with regard to emergency measures to make sure that we are supportive of those measures as well. Uh, COVID-19 is and continues to be, has been and continues to be an extremely difficult uh, issue for the district to navigate. and. What makes it so difficult is the fate of this district and the ability of this district to facilitate in-person learning, to return to a state of normalcy. Uh, all campuses open, on-campus learning opportunities, traditional instruction. Our ability to do that is inextricably linked to the behavior of this community because whether a, a faculty member, an employee, or a student contracts COVID-19, out in the community or in one of our schools, the result is the same. We still have to quarantine. We still have to remove teachers from classrooms. We still have to close classrooms. We still have to close schools. Most recently, CE Rose. In the case of CE Rose, it didn't matter where those four staff members contracted the virus. All that matters is the virus was contracted. Largely out in the community, the result is the same. And I know that we have heard talking points in the media, we've heard talking points with the Pima County Health Department that transmission rates inside of schools are low. That is true. But an additional talking point that I would like to add here this evening is though transmission points 
and points of transmission and rates of transmission inside of schools is relatively low, rates of transmission in the community are at a category of widespread status, which has the same result. So transmission on campus or in the community has the exact same disruptive result, classrooms and school closures and quarantines, which compromise the district's ability to facilitate in-person instruction. The amount of positive cases in the district combined with a lack of available subs and the amount of students, hundreds upon hundreds of students and employees in a quarantine situation for either having tested positive for the virus or having been identified through contact tracing being exposed to the virus, being asked to quarantine do not allow for a safe, op a safe opening for in-person instruction uh, or hybrid at this particular time. As I've said, and I'll continue to say, our faith and our ability to bring students back to school, be able to open up our classrooms and do what we do best, provide the magic of the on-campus on experience for thousands of students each and every day, not just uh, through the provision of our curriculum in English language arts and math, social studies and science, but through the magic of our arts programs and our extracurricular uh, opportunities, that is wholly dependent on the ability of this community to embrace the advice of the Pima County Health Department, the Center for Disease Control, and to comply with the requested mandates of the Pima County Board of Supervisors and our City Council and our Mayor to take COVID-19 seriously, to take seriously the implementation, the execution of every mitigation effort possible on an individual scale, small group scale, and as an organization that is the only way we are going to be able to give the gift of school back to the thousands of students and the thousands of employees that have been waiting for it. So just wanted to make sure that we provided that update here this evening on the opening of school. We have received a lot of questions and a lot of emails about when and if we are going to open in person for second semester. A quick update for winter sports, we were notified just prior to our last meeting on November 17th, that the Arizona Interscholastic Association had recommended the delayed start of the winter sports season through the month of December. Our athletic directors uh, are gonna work across districts to make sure that January and February schedules do everything that they can to reflect this lost time. At this particular time, uh, winter programs may only hold voluntary conditioning sessions at the discretion of their head coaches. Head coaches have the option to not run conditioning sessions and to keep their athletes home if that's their choice. What is not permitted right now, games, full contact practices, competitions, or tournaments. So right now, consistent with other districts in uh, Pima County, outdoor voluntary uh, conditioning, particularly for the sports of basketball and soccer, uh, are authorized at the discretion of the head coaches. Some good news for the employees of the Tucson Unified School District, the Arizona Department of Health Services has identified uh, the Tucson Unified School District as a school district it would like to welcome into its COVID-19 testing pilot program that will offer weekly testing opportunities to the employees and the families of the Tucson Unified School District. Uh, the Arizona Department of Health Services and Arizona State University have teamed up to make this pilot program possible. Under this pilot program, Arizona Department of Health Services, they will be providing staff and contact tracing teams to the district to be able to facilitate a weekly testing super site, if you will, at High Corbett Field. And High Corbett will now become the hub that will be open and available to Tucson Unified uh, School District employees and families that have children presenting with symptoms that might be picked up at our schools and asked to quarantine will now have a place to go free of charge. This testing super site at Corbett can be available as frequently as often as three days a week, but must minimally be open at least one day a week. Uh, we will also receive contact tracing assistance that will help the hardworking team members that we have uh, working across the district in health services. And even we see some of our administrators doing a lot of the contact tracing. This is going to be some welcome relief. And uh, we will be recommending that 
our employees test every opportunity that they get. Uh, we are working diligently with Arizona Department of Health Services to make sure that the High Corbett Field testing super site is open for business and fully operational at the beginning of the second semester in January. I want to thank Nikki Stefan, our Director for Health Services, um, and our Assistant Superintendent, our Regional Assistant Superintendent, Mrs. Holly Lehman Hamill, is serving for serving as our lead administrative contact persons with both ASU and the Department of Health Services to expedite this, uh, make sure that expedite uh, this pilot program so that we're up and ready to go immediately when we return in the second semester, Jan first week of January. An update tonight on our concerns about the alarming rate of Fs that we have seen uh, awarded to students, particularly in the secondary levels. We have received some emails, we have received some calls to the audience, and I wanna assuage a little bit of the anguish that's out there tonight. There is no action, no recommendation this evening. Um, we are gonna be working diligently with TEA and EY leadership this week to start talking about a proposed solution. A proposed solution that will strike a balance between student accountability and teacher responsibility. Student accountability for putting forth an effort, for meeting expectations, both academic and behavioral, for completing work, for participating, for contributing to class, teacher responsibility to make sure that interventions are being provided, responsibility, communicating with parents, letting parents know that their kids are either in danger of failing or academically failing, giving students an opportunity to meet expectations. We feel that discussions with TEA leadership and EY leadership can strike this balance and are looking forward to these conversations uh, that will be going on later this week. So tonight, we have no recommendations to discuss, and we are asking the board not to take any kind of an action tonight. Instead, we will be solely focused on our comprehensive academic support plan that we will be providing and implementing across the district for students that are having difficulties with remote learning. This challenge with regard to academic failure is multifaceted. Therefore, it calls for a multifaceted solution. We can't be making sweeping assumptions that kids are simply refusing to do work, nor can we make a sweeping assumption that sometimes our kids aren't a little bit lazy and don't wanna log on. We can't make assumptions that students had everything that they needed with regard to technology, access to technology or Wi-Fi hotspots at the beginning of the school year, first day. We have a combination of a challenge with getting access to devices and Wi-Fi hotspots, lack of clarity about grading expectations, workload that have all combined to create a very complicated challenge that I think we can come together and meet. Lack of access to devices and internet connectivity did negatively impact thousands of students during the first month of the 2021 school year, particularly the first three weeks of school uh, before we could finally get the bulk and the majority of our Chromebooks distributed uh, across the district just prior to the Labor Day weekend. You can see here just a brief look uh, for the public and for our board members. The alarming increase in the amount of Fs, particularly at the secondary level, does warrant uh, some actions on our part to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our students and striking that balance that I talked about. You can see that particularly at the most uh, crucial grades, arguably the most crucial grades in the TUSD system right now, middle grade, we have almost uh, doubled the amount of Fs uh, when you compare to the Fs that were uh, earned by sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders in the 1920 school year compared to Fs that were received in the 2020-2021 school year. You can see that the trend is also increasing uh, for high schools. I want to caution the community and our board and our employees not to feel too badly or to paint this as a TUSD specific issue. Um, there have been numerous news stories on CBS radio, national public, uh, national public radio, and across various media outlets of districts across the nation, noting dramatic increases in academic failure at all levels. This is simply a result of the pandemic and like all other 
aspects of the pandemic, we are better together. When we sit down with our leadership teams from our different employee associations, get teacher feedback, get student feedback, get parent feedback, a lot of times those closest to the challenge have the best solutions. So we look forward to those discussions later this week. I will be conducting a series of focus groups uh, over the next uh, week. I had a wonderful focus group uh, assisted by Mr. Almquist out at Tucson High. I wanna thank him for his efforts uh, in bringing some students together to communicate with me, as well as board member elect Natalie Luna regarding some of the challenges with online learning, workload, and a lack of consistency with grading expectations across uh, classes. I look forward to facilitating even more remote, uh, remote learning focus groups uh, from our students. And as that concludes the business end of the superintendent's report, I wanna take a moment to share some final thoughts about our governing board members that will be departing us this evening. And Jean, if you will, if you can have the videos queued up uh, after these final thoughts, we will shift right into a tribute video uh, for our uh, departing board members, give them an opportunity uh, to make some uh, some final share some final words uh, during the board member activity reports. And as a final note of positivity, we also have a tribute video to share with our board members that celebrates all of the amazing work that our teachers have done during this period of remote instruction. We recognize that as board members, you typically will only hear the negative. You'll receive emails from parents that aren't happy with the level of communication they're receiving or they're not happy with the devices they receive, or the internet is too slow, or schools aren't responding to them fast enough. So we thought tonight, for your final evening, for the three of you, we would take some time, take a break from the challenges, and celebrate the amazing work that our educators have engaged in over the last nine or 10 months, and that will be directly following our board member tribute video. But when I think and I reflect, I think about how we all began our 2020, and I recognize that all of you began your 2020 journeys in very, very different places. All of you through our one-on-one -on -one meetings, especially early in the year, I found you to be excited and passionate about finally realizing your passion points for TUSD in this, the final year of your term. It was a year that began very, very full of promise with the district reducing its enrollment loss to unprecedentedly low levels and retaining over a thousand more students than we were able to retain during the 2019 fiscal year. And a nice $6 million budget surplus because of that increased enrollment. And then like a storm across the Pacific came COVID. Literally overnight, I watched in awe as you transitioned from elected officials to public health experts, forced to make gut-wrenching critical decisions for our students and our employees regarding what has now officially become the leading cause of death in America, COVID-19, officially surpassing heart disease as the number one killer of Americans across all age groups. And all the while having to make these critical decisions about this deadly disease after being informed that funding would be taken away from the district because of our decision to keep everybody safe in a state of remote learning to the startling amount of almost $10 million a 5% hit per student for your decision to support re remote learning. And then on top of that, being informed by our district's insurance carrier, the Arizona Risk and Retention Trust, that it would not cover the district for any claims or lawsuits related to any third party suing the district because of an allegation of contracting COVID-19 or suffering from COVID-19-like illnesses as a result of being on our campuses. And if that weren't challenging enough, all while being gripped by a vicious cross current of the competing preferences and needs of the stakeholders that we love the most, of our teachers and our parents. The need of our teachers to return their kids to in-person learning and the need of our employees to remain remote, keep their families safe. Almost assured a definite loss of teachers through resignation and retirement or a definite loss of parents and students through a loss of enrollment, no matter what gut-wrenching decision you would make. These dire circumstances gave birth to an opportunity for absolutely extraordinary leadership 
especially when you are charged with stepping up and making these decisions as elected officials, making no money, only giving the gift of your time and making crucial decisions about the two things that people care most about in this entire world, their children and their loved ones. This is what I wanna thank you for here this evening. This extraordinary leadership that you've demonstrated over the last months. Because I know our time together pre-2020, it has seen its share of achievements that you can be proud of. The reopening of Wakefield, a new innovation tech high school, historic increases in instructional spending, salary and compensation packages that you've approved that have made our teachers amongst the highest paid in Southern Arizona, the millions of dollars that you've approved for the purchase of over 10,000 Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots that have struck a impressive blow in closing the digital divide here in this district. The adoption of a fully inclusive family life curriculum and the addition of gender identity expression and sexual orientation in our district's non-discrimination policy. Though the achievements have been many and you can be proud of your pre-2020 work, it's these last nine months, the grace, the commitment, the determination, compassion, the patience, the courage, the resilience that you've all demonstrated over this pandemic period that I feel will be your greatest legacy and greatest gift to this community. So on behalf of the Tucson Unified Community and our almost 8,000 employees, 43,000 students, I wish you all the best, many more years of health, happiness, and service. Video, please. Every leadership journey has a beginning. Every leadership journey has a beginning and it has an end. It's what happens in between that determines the legacy of the leader. And for the three of you, what a journey it has been. As a board member, you're the liaison between the district and community. A board member takes into account the needs of a district faculty, staff, students, and parents. You are the voice and decision making representing Tucson Unified School District. From a dramatic expansion of CTE programming, making us a premier CTE destination in the state of Arizona, to the dramatic expansion of the arts, to the opening of Wakefield Middle School and a brand new Innovation Tech High School. You've made our campuses safer with the purchase of keyless entry pads at every single school. You've made our teachers some of the best compensated in all of Pima County. And you've made our students feel loved with your purchase of technology and approval of purchasing of instruments, software programs, and cutting edge resources that our students now have inside of their schools. Ms. Foster, I see the passion come through during your discussions of the items that you believe are for the betterment of our students and our district. Ms. Sedwick Gordon, your enthusiasm toward the teachers, staff, and students have not gone unnoticed. Mr. Burke, you bring such a calmness to every meeting and it also shows when you are speaking about the issues that are most important to our district. Thank you for making our district the thriving learning community of diversity and thought and love and performance and excellence that it is. We know that you don't hear this enough, but thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us in TUSD. We sure appreciate you. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank you for all your service. I know uh, many of you have been here through very tumultuous times. And uh, together as a board and as a district, we've, we've partnered to make this where I feel still the best district that's available to all our kids and our community staff. So. Without the, the hours of work, the late nights, I just want to thank you for all your service. Thank you, Governing Board Members. Thank you, Board Members. Thank you, Governing Board. On behalf of the students and the employees in the community that we serve, 
Governing Board President Foster, Board Member Burke, Board Member Sedgwick, we wish you all of the best and health and happiness and service. We'll miss you and we'll think of you often. And one final uh, video to celebrate the era that you helped ushered in, a celebration of our teachers' dedication, commitment, and excellence with remote instruction over these last nine months. Video number two, please. I think I saw a lot of kids be successful with online. I don't always want to tell them that because I want them to come to school and I want to see them, but at the same time I'm like, this, this worked for you. Maybe we are catching up, maybe we're just finding better ways to, to help kids. It was a big learning curve to get my practice in person into online. Uh, learning from other teachers, online, Google, YouTube, everything that I could. I believe that the benefits that online brings they were strong and they were good. So I'm going to start from the beginning which was very nice to see how excited they were to be able to be back in school. <laughs> and my mom was a gate teacher for TUSD, my aunt is a retired teacher from Tucson High, I had an IT and HVAC, both uncles in both areas. First thing in the morning we set everything up and we make sure we're signed on to Zoom so when we walk in the classroom one person can go on and Zoom with the online kids and we have everything ready for the in-person kids realizing what I can do and can't do. Thing they can learn the same way almost we've always been teaching just with a little bit of adaptations. My, my view of being passionate is to make learning fun and you're just like this is never going to work but when they have that aha moment and the light bulb goes off and they're like I did it it makes your day <laughs> I always compare our work in our classrooms with I think it's like a marriage it's like a family dynamic where everyone has different roles and we all support each other we've become family our communication has been very important the parents have been great and we're getting through this together hopefully we've taken the best of both worlds whether they're distance learning or you know in the in the hybrid model that we're doing the, aside from mom and dad and what happens they see a teacher and they receiving knowledge they're sharing with their friends and they they just love that calm and like forgiveness like it's gonna work out whether it works out in this first minute or the last minute it's gonna be okay but I just I want kids to be better and be the best that they can be and that's I think really where my passion comes from is making sure that kids are successful and get the most out of this life. Then I all have to step back and laugh and smile at their cuteness and how they, it was like I was having a party. Online learning is here to stay one way, in one way or another. I am really pleased with how um, the district has handled the pandemic crisis in terms of education. Their first priority is our children's health, our employee, the employee's health, and, and the family's. So I, I'm really proud of that and proud to work for TUSD. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Trujillo. And that concludes our report and our recognitions. Thank you, that was very special. I didn't know I was gonna to have to have a, a box of Kleenex here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, board member, any comments before we move on to our activity reports? Ms. Grijalva. I just wanna say thank you. I know how difficult board service can be, 
Um, I've had an opportunity to work with Mr. Burke in two different boards, um, and the experience has always been he brings a sense of calm, a sense of like really trying to bring people together. And I just can't think of another person who would have been able to step in and serve as that liaison for this board. Um, and Crystal, I just don't know what it's gonna be like for the next, you know, next month. And um, you're not gonna be there. And um, you've been a very wonderful friend. And I know that many, many people in this community can thank you personally, not just, but you for getting elected. I, you're the hardest work in person. I know any election season and you're a very good friend. And I think that your voice is gonna be missing on the board when it comes to looking at curriculum. And so I hope you're still paying attention cause I'll probably still be texting you like, hey, are you watching? Cause you need to pay attention, throw me some stuff. And um, Rachel, you know, I know that we didn't always see eye to eye but I do appreciate the fact that I think that we brought out really good qualities in each other of either we're gonna stick to the position that we're in and we have to do our research and homework to make sure we come prepared. Or there are times that we look at each other and we're like, okay, we're agreeing on this one. And so I think that both of us have really learned a lot from the opportunity of having board service. I think it, being a board member is an incredibly difficult thing. When people say it's a thankless job, um, I remember graduations and so Dr. Trujillo, Right now, I would like to ask that whenever we do have in-person graduations, that we reach out to these three people to see if they wanna come back and um, give out some diplomas and shake some hands when it's safe, because that is the one thing I think that we all, at the end of every year, you're like, that year was a rough one, but this graduation is yeah. amazing and it's totally worth it. And so I wanna make sure that um, each of them has the opportunity to come back, because I know that that was something that we really missed this year. But thank you all for your service. For sure. That was the best part of this. People think it's Tuesday night, but it's graduation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's the next item is all um is Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do want to uh, to take the opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Tujillo and to the administration uh, and to each of the other board members. I think that Ms. Pihalwa just spoke very well, um, and uh, it's not easy to be a board member, but it was a pleasure at the end of the day. <clears throat> excuse me, it was a pleasure to work with all of you. <clears throat> excuse me, and I would like to uh, to also give a shout out to to uh, Dr. Stegman and Mr. Hicks, who I was able, you know, I sat on the board with them. Um, and unlike you, Ms. Foster, I, I was only on the board once, so each of those four years uh, to me, I uh, they were very, very challenging, but I learned a great deal. And I am, uh, I am proud of the work that we as a board were able to accomplish at despite any of the uh, difficulties along the way. I think those challenging moments were, as Ms. Grijalva pointed out, absolutely learning moments. And it's been a pleasure to serve on the board and it's been a pleasure to serve the teachers and the students of TUSD. And I wanna thank also our governing board staff uh, that at the end, we when I started, there were more staff members and now we just have um, Michelle and Yolanda, and they do the work of uh, an entire team. And so I just, my, my truly heartfelt thanks go out to the staff and the administration and all of the board members. So thank you very much. I think we just overlapped items because that was our board member activity report. So I wasn't skipping you at all, Ms. Sedwick Gordon. If that's, um, I was going on to our board member activity report, so we each have a moment to address, to 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 give our our remarks. So, Mr. Burke, I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you, President Foster. I um, I do have to make the observation that when we uh, talk about elected officials, that although I was one in the past, um, I just dropped in on you by appointment in November of last year. So. Um, I must say that it's been a very event-filled 13 months. Uh, you know, people often ask me when I'm out on the street and they say, uh, oh, you're on the school board. Well, well tell me, what's, uh, what surprised you the most about an issue on the school board? And I always tell them, hey, 
I was on the school board before, so nothing that comes before TUSD school board will ever surprise me. Uh, you know, it's, um, well, there was, there is one thing that surprised me. And that is, I never thought I would be saying goodbye and ending my tenure on a Zoom conference call. Uh, I think that's made it a bit harder to have conversation, but I think we've, we've handled it very well. And I really appreciate what staff has done uh, to keep us uh, communicating with, with the community, even though uh, it is by remote. And, and I also want to give this assurance. Though I have been tempted, I never wore Bermuda shorts or my bathing suit to a meeting. <laughs> you know, uh, when I spoke from the dais last November, I expressed the hope that we'd work together and, and make our decisions uh, in a collegial way. And I, and I think that we've accomplished that. And it's been a pleasure to work with each of you uh, on this board and you, Dr. Tejo. I also want to say that uh, I appreciate very much the staff, the administrators, and the teachers who make this district such a wonderful and important part of our community. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with you uh, this last year. And I want to say that the work that you do, and I'm talking about the community as a whole, makes this a very important and enduring, and in so many ways, a successful educational institution. I have to say, as I end it, I'm TUSD proud, and I always will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Ms. Counts, would you like to share something before I? Um, yes, I don't have much to say, and I feel a little bit at a loss for words, but I do want to just extend my gratitude um, to President Foster, Board Member Sedgwick Gordon, and Board Member Burke. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you, and whether we were working together in, an, in agreement or we were finding ourselves at opposite ends of an issue, it was always an opportunity to learn and to grow, and this is an incredibly hard thing to do as a volunteer and the level of commitment and service um, that you exemplified week after week and in all your work um, was really inspiring inspiring to me and will help me in guiding me through um, these next few years so thank you so much thank you for your service and it's been a pleasure thank you so I got a little creative on mine. I hope that's okay on my board member report. Is it okay if I share my screen? By all means, yes. Okay, let me try to do this here. Um, I did practice. So let's see if this works. Can you guys see all these people? I'm gonna to start to cry. Um, are you guys able to see people? Because I can, okay. And um, so I could go through a list of things that I'm proud of these last eight years, but instead my parting remarks really are about all of these people who have sat in the seat with me. Um, I couldn't have done anything without community and friendship. <sighs> I've had the opportunity to work with and get to know the most amazing people, some of whom I invited to be with, um, with me here this evening. Uh, friends who, came, who were with me from the beginning, like Katie and Kelly and Jessica, Liz and Luke, Julia and Cami, the Mexican American studies leaders who inspired me from day one, like Sal and Augie and Maria, Larry, Jose and Norma teacher friends who kept me in touch with our, with our classrooms like Amy and Andy, Art, Rachel, Francis, Jason and Margaret, Billy, Julie, and Joy, Imelda, Wes, Stephanie, Nanette, and Jonathan. Principals like Ava and Deanna, Debbie, Tanya, Terry, Rob, Laura, Taz, Jeff and Brenda, Frankie, Andrea, Jose, Judy, Cameron, and Zulema and amazing students who, who I've gotten to know through their brilliance, their passion and activism 
like Bill and Dea, Anna, Alex, Melissa, Lucia, Stefan, Kathleen, Madeline, Lourdes, uh, Lulu, David, and Juvenice. Uh, Parents and passionate community members like Allison, Shelly, and Mark, and Erica, Jaime, Jose, Jansen, Damon, Sam, and Jeffrey, Trehan, Moses, Deanna, Lizette, Carol, Elizabeth, and Megan. Um, superintendents like Gabe, of course, Steve, John, Todd, Scott, Lupita, Jan, and of course, HT. And the media, reporters that I trust and depend on like like Dylan and Danielle and Eric and Sarah, Susan and Ibram. Um, through the Arizona School Board Association, I got to know so many amazing school board members um, across our state and I really depended on them because we don't get to connect with the five of us here, but I was able to you know, connect with Elenia and Sarah May, Devin and Monica and Adam, <laughs> Kara, Lindsay, and not a board member, but I have to include Panfilo Contreras, of course. I got to travel to national school board um, conferences where I became friends with board members in other states like Augustine and Nora. Um, and TUSD board, as a board member, I was invited to different universities to speak, uh, like Miami, Bowdoin, Illinois State, and the University of Connecticut, where I met young, amazing superstar educators like, like Justice Lopez, just hashtag happy vism or the thriving teacher project like i'm just so inspired by these young teachers um i relied on my professor friends here at the u of a mary carol nolan andrea francesca and through this role i could call a national rock star professors like betty beaver and christine sleater and david stovall for guidance and advice um, i got to run races with other candidates like david and jen and lane and gabriella I got to call in my elected friends for support like Stephanie, you did it, <laughs> Stephanie, Victoria, Andres, Mayor Regina Romero, and Congressman Raul Grijalva. And I really, really miss Richard Elias, who would take my call always and give me the very best advice. Um, I couldn't do anything without our board office staff, Mary Alice and Sylvia, and Michelle and Yolanda, Nick and Sarah. And I will end by thanking Bruce for stepping up this last year. Thank you so much. And I wish Adelita and Layla the very best in working with our incoming board members, Ravi, Sadie, and Natalie, who please know you can call on me for any help or advice. And many times over the years, people have said that this is thankless work. And I, and I always disagree and I correct them because this work has transformed me in ways that I could never have imagined. It's a volunteer gig. And as many of you know, when you volunteer and you give back, work like this is fulfilling and transforming. And even though I won't be in the seat or in the square, <laughs> I, will, I should say that it's been an honor to do this work with you. And I will always stand up for public education. And I will always, always be proud to be TUSD. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining me too. Miss Foster. Ms. Foster, you're uh, muted. Yes, I had to mute myself because I had to figure out how to, to, to get out of that, but I'm back. So thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Foster. Yes, Ms. Hedwick Corden. Um, that was uh, that was beautiful. Thank you. I you know I um, I thank you for your service also, but you just reminded me that um, in my term as a board member, I I think that. Um, I was able to accomplish some things thanks to the rest of the board. I was not able to accomplish other things, but one of the things that uh, we did do that I think um, all of TUSD will thank us for is uh, hiring Dr. Trujillo. And uh, the work that you, Dr. Trujillo, have done 
since you came on board is, um, is truly impressive. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for bringing the district to this place. Uh, thank you for everything that you have managed to do under COVID-19 and for, for hiring the administration that you have hired, for choosing the people that you have chosen. I think that you have a, a phenomenal team, that you're a fantastic leader, and that um, there's only up to go from here. And so I have high hopes for, for TUSD and for the TUSD board. And I echo Ms. Foster's comments um, the, to future board members, if you're watching. Uh, I would love, you know, anytime you want to reach out, I'm definitely here. And, um, and also to Ms. Grijalwa, who has been on the board for so many, many years uh, and will continue on despite other opportunities. I think that everybody owes you a... Uh, uh, a thank you. And uh, even though, as you said, we have not always been on the same side, we have always managed to challenge each other and make each other think. And I think that, um, and that is worth a great deal of gratitude. So again, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Ms. Counts. Thank you, Ms. Lihalwa. And most of all, thank you, Dr. Trujillo and the TUSD administration. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And Dr. Ross, uh, Mr. Ross, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Okay, that was a that was a good one. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments before I close our board member activity reports? Okay, with that we will move on to the call to the audience. Doctor, are we turn this over to Miss Counts? Miss Counts. Miss Counts. Yes. Yes. Give me one minute to pull this up. Okay. During the audience call, the board clerk will recognize speakers and maintain order by setting appropriate limitations. The governing board is committed to the safety of the entire TUSD community. In order to observe the recommended safeguards for reducing the rate of spread of COVID-19, the following procedures related to the call to the audience portion of board meetings will be observed. All public comments for the meeting were accepted in written form. Public comments will be read into the record by the program coordinator of staff services to the governing. During my board. report, I tried to de-escalate uh, the rating Dr. issue. Dr. Trickio, we can hear you. Um, our staff will make sure each board member receives a copy. At the conclusion of the call to the audience, the governing board president will ask if individual board members wish to respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the board, wish to ask staff to review a matter, or wish to ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. By law, at most two board members can address any single issue raised during the call to the audience. Now let me pull up our list of speakers. And our first speaker of the night is Catherine Donovan. Dear Governing Board and Dr. Trujillo, thank you for taking the time to listen to stakeholders' opinions about the possibility of not having grades count this semester. My name is Kate Donovan and I'm a parent of a student at Tucson High School and have been a teacher at THS for 19 years. When I heard that you are considering not having grades count this semester, I was and am out, outraged. I have been a teacher for 28 years and this is the most disrespectful thing I could possibly imagine being thought up for both students and teachers alike. If you, may, if you vote to make grades not count this semester, you will be voting for us as an educational institution to lose all respect from our community, not just this year, but to be a laughing stock indefinitely. I am appalled that this is even being voted upon. This, the message that this would sound loudly and clearly to all students is, is that school does not matter. To the students that have worked incredibly hard and have proven their intrinsic motivation, it says that their dedication to their studies and hard work means nothing. To the students who have chosen to do little to nothing, and there are a lot of them, it says to be lazy, do nothing, society will continue to enable you to hide in your room and on your phone and have zero work ethic. Even to the students that have legitimate problems accessing Wi-Fi or who have had to work to help support their families, it says school doesn't really matter and it's just a joke. If you vote not to have grades count this semester, the message that this sends to teachers is that all of our hard work means absolutely nothing and that you all have not even a drop of respect for what we continue to struggle to do for our students. 
These are indeed difficult days and we need to be flexible with our students. However, this proposition of not having grades count sets our students up for absolute failure in life. Yes, these are challenging times, but this is exactly when we have to encourage our students not to give up. If you vote to make grades not count, we are setting up our society for collapse. If anything, perhaps give students a chance to keep their grades they have or give them a chance to retake whatever class or grade they are in, they are in next year. To simply allow everyone to pass or not acknowledge the hard work many students have put in will have a detrimental effect on their ed dedication to education and working hard in general. I beg of you, do not make this monumental mistake. Please show some respect to students and teachers alike. Grades should count. This literally will affect our future as a society in a deep way. Please do not vote to discard grades. Please show that you have any respect for teachers and the students who have worked hard so, so hard under these extraordinary circumstances. Sincerely, Kate Donovan. Thank you. Next is Dolores Tavera. Today, I write to you to say thank you to the three governing board members who are experiencing their, experiencing their last meeting tonight. Just reading the pile of emails I alone have sent you has taken a few hours from your lives, I think. Ms. Foster and Mr. Burke have both met with me in groups at different times as well. But I want to especially thank Rachel Sedgwick. When you came on board, you took swift and decisive action to remove the then superintendent's contract, and I know you were widely criticized, if not vilified for it. I don't think the media or the general public really understood why you took that action. You aren't allowed to talk about it, and I don't claim to know why you did it. But I do know that H.T. Sanchez wasn't telling the board accurate information about how substitute teachers were paid. He and his staff for more than a year falsely and repeatedly told board members he gave subs a pay raise when he clearly gave us a pay cut. Just one of several specific variable misrepresentations he made about us. How disheartening it was knowing certain board members were believing him and not us. In addition to cutting our pay, he kicked loyal, hardworking employees out of the state retirement system, all while he was taking an unprecedented raise for himself. How are the victims of H.T. Sanchez supposed to judge him as anything but heartless, dishonest, and selfish? Ms. Sedgwick, as a board member, you absolutely have had a right to have honest communication from staff, as do we all. Board members can't make good decisions unless they are told the truth. So thank you for the swift action you took to bring an honest leader to the district. I remember the day I met Dr. Trujillo and he acknowledged the cut. With a new leader, we were able to get the pay cut reversed, our lives improved. Ms. Sedgwick, you spoke up for us even though we hadn't worked on your campaign or contributed money to get you elected. At your public chats at CDs, subs who would never speak at governing board meetings came. You made us feel seen and heard and respected. We heard other members of the public come talk to you about the name of rodeo days or their kids' food allergies or a range of topics that they really cared about. Your critics came too. You were a shining example of a public servant who truly had an open door policy and listened. You have only served one term, but be assured, Ms. Sedgwick, in that one term, you made a huge difference for the hundreds of subs who served this district. We shouldn't have to come to our elected leaders multiple times to declare the emperor isn't telling the truth and he's hurting us before a person in power listens and cares enough to do something. While other politicians made me cynical about the political process, you restored my faith. Thank you, Ms. Sedgwick. Thank you. Next is Risa Olson. Good evening to USD board members. I would like to respectfully ask each of you to vote for postponing hybrid schedules until at least spring break 2021 or later. Yes, that would mean an entire year of learning and teaching remotely, but the most important aspect of that is by continuing to have remote learning with just learning pods at schools, we are keeping ourselves safe. That should be at the forefront of everyone's minds, safety. This deadly pandemic is spreading. Many, unfortunately, do not take it seriously and do not abide by safety protocols of wearing masks, physically distancing by at least six feet, and maintaining immediate family groups only. Just follow, following the protocols while at school does not keep these people safe, nor those of us who follow the guidelines everywhere we go. Family gatherings during Thanksgiving didn't help and neither will family gatherings at Christmas and friend gatherings at New Year's. 
Immediate families of TUSD are staying safe by not returning to schools, by staying away from those who don't practice safety protocols, and by being only with our immediate families. And yet there are those who have contracted a positive outcome of the virus. There would be more sad and tragic outcomes if TUSD were to open. Vaccines will be available at some point, but until then, we owe it, you owe it to all the people involved with TUSD to continue to allow us and our immediate families to stay safe. Every evening when I watch the news and the time comes to celebrate the lives of some of those whose lives have been cut short due to the virus, I hear about teachers dying, about school bus drivers dying, about school staff, staffers dying. I understand the desire for many parents, especially those of young children, to want schools to reopen. But at what cost? At whose cost? Please don't make me and other school employee make a tough decision to take a leave of absence or quit being by opening up schools while there is still a high risk of catching the, this virus. No one should have to find out if their COVID positive creates just a horrible feeling of the flu or days in an ICU, long lasting side effects or death. I'm hoping and praying that you consider the lives of those you would impact by a decision to reopen schools in January. Thank you, Risa Olson. Thank you, next is Rachel Zacharitz Johnson. To the governing board, first and foremost, I wish to express my gratitude and sincere appreciation to President Crystal Foster. She has been a true champion for public education and TUSD. Her service to this community has been outstanding and never wavered. We have been so fortunate to have had her as an advocate for many years. On another note, I hope that you are all listening. What we as teachers and school staff went through from October 27th through November 7th was truly despic despicable. I understand wanting to please parents and keep families in our district. I do, however, science matters. This pandemic is very real. Our leadership on a national and state level have failed us. I am a teacher and a parent. I want to be back in school. I want my son to be experiencing his senior year in school. I hope that is clear to you. It is simply not safe. If Dr. Thruhill had not made the decision, decision to keep us remote, I would not still be with TUSD. I am certainly not alone. I am still completely appalled that the staff with pre-existing conditions were told that they needed to show up or take unpaid leave of absences. ADE, ADA accommodations and law were just thrown out the window like they didn't exist. Teachers and other staff matter. Please do not treat us as disposable and re replaceable. Listen to us, Rachel Z. Johnson. Here next is Wesley Oswald. TUSD Governing Board. I am writing to ask that you vote to make sure that schools remain closed to in-person learning in quarter three. I'm so proud that TUSD is the only district in Pima County that has stuck with the distance learning only for the entire school year thus far. We need to remain online. Our state's COVID-19 cases are completely out of control with over 12,000 new cases announced just today. Our hospitals are filling up and our state still doesn't even have a mask mandate. Please keep our community safe by allowing us to continue to teach and learn online. I long for the day that it will be safe to return to in-person learning, but that does not look to be anytime soon. I do not envy the tough decisions you have before you, but as leaders, I hope you will lead with integrity and do what is right and safe. Sincerely, Wes Oswald. Next is Dan Ireland. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Trujillo and lead council. I am writing you all on the topic of changes to first semester grading. My name is Dan Ireland and I'm a 15 year TUSD veteran teacher. When I look at our list of failing, grads, of failing grades, I am too concerned. This pandemic and remote learning experience has been difficult for students, families, teachers, and staff. We can all agree we don't want to see the students fail due to circumstances they, don't, they didn't have a choice in. As school employees, we go the extra mile to meet the special circumstances of our le learners. I talk to teachers constantly on how they are modifying and accommodating students in these special times but at the end of the day, we must trust our educators. There are students that have been adversely affected by this and they deserve that to be taken into consideration. That's the role of the teacher, however, not the board. Grades are more than just earning credits towards graduation. They represent a student's level of competency in a specific area of skills. 
We empower our teachers to determine this. It is their sole responsibility. And if you opt to override this, you undermine every teacher's judgment to assess the proficiency of their students. This would also violate your own board policies regarding grading, failures, and assigning incomplete grades. A large increase in failures is bad, but delegitimizing a teacher's role in their classroom and essentially telling students their efforts are irrelevant is even worse. Instead, trust your teachers and your schools to determine who earned credits and how best to work with the students who didn't. In May, when you oversee the graduations of these students and you swear and attest publicly that they have met the standards and requirements to hold that co coveted diploma, that still has to mean something. Thank you, Dan Ireland. Thank you. Next is Alicia McKendry, Jennifer Payne, and Jennifer Merritt. Dear TUC board members, we are writing to implore the board members to make the decision that all classified staff and other non-teaching persons who have been reporting for on-site duty since September 28th on an alternating schedule be allowed to return to remote only. There has been a dramatic spike in the number of cases in Pima County since, the, since the, this decision was made to start to bringing staff back on campus. The risk to staff and students who must be on campus to perform their job duties or receive services it is needlessly increased by having employees who do not need to be in person to perform their job duties. The more people that are staying at home, the safer everyone will be. Keeping non-essential classified staff at home will be a part of the solution to slowing the spread in our community. Thank you for making decisions to keep all members of our TUSD community safe. Alicia McKendry, Jennifer Payne, and Jennifer Merritt. Next is Lillian Fox. Rachel Sedgwick will be missed. She has worked so hard for employees and students. Rachel has been a shining star on a board that has often too, that has too often played political games. I wish all the happiness and success possible to you, Rachel, in your future pursuits. The plans described in item 9.3 to help struggling students appear to be out of touch with what TUSD teachers and students are experiencing now. There does not appear to have been input from or a review by TUSD teachers and parents. I urge the board to ask that the plans be put out for public review and now to get valuable input from the teachers and parents. As the plans are now, the objectives are listed. It's clear TUSD understands that too many students are failing and students' attendance is awful. There isn't any information about the causes. If TUSD doesn't know why failure rates are so high and attendance is so poor, there's no chance the plan will turn things around. TUSD plans appear to be one, to check the box that we have a plan, and two, to just do more of the same things that haven't worked. Doing virtually the same things and experiencing different results is called insanity. Lillian Fox. Next is Jason Freed. My name is Jason Freed, a middle school math teacher who is here today out of appreciation and concern regarding item 9.3. I appreciate the governing board is analyzing how students have been doing, realizing that there have been struggles and looking at ways to address those issues. There has been thoughtful planning of T by TUSD administration and it shows promise. I must admit, most teachers are already doing many of the things listed, although admittedly, there is less likely documentation and structure in our current attempts. While there are positives in this plan, my concerns far outweigh them. I would first ask how many current classroom teachers were involved as well as school level TDRB and administration. There seems to be almost an assumption that these actions were not, are not happening, when again, most are. Actually, every teacher I talk to shares that they have made more parent contacts this semester than any previous school year and working more hours than previous school years, which leads into my second concern. There is a, competent in the, there is a component in the drafted plan that requires teachers, specifically ELA and math, to provide additional support for struggling students. Although the concept is a good one, there are a few inherent, inherent problems. One, where would the time for this support come from as teachers are already teaching all day? In addition, math and ELA teachers already have the stress and weight of the testing data 
heavily on their shoulders. So to add that, to add to that stress and weight seems unfair. There should be other individuals that might be looked to in support of this work, either at the school or district level, but to add to teachers' workloads, specifically math and ELA, seems unjust. Lastly, there seems to be some discussion of changing the grading system or expectations, literally days before the end of the semester. Students and families have been made well aware of the standard and administration has made every attempt to make certain all students have access to the material. There is simply no rationale for changing grades. If you wouldn't, make an, if you wouldn't take an earned A away from a student, you should not take away an earned F. These are clear and real issues this semester, ones that we need to address. Unequivocally, changing grades will not address these issues. They will actually exacerbate the issue. Yes, we do need to find ways to connect and engage our students and families. Although honestly, that has proven already to be a daunting challenge in some instances. Let's encourage teachers to find what has worked and what has not, then come up with the site plans for attempting to address the lack of involvement. Anything else is likely to have us spinning our wheels, burning out the already exhausted teachers. Also, congratulations to Mr. Burke, Ms. Foster for your fine leadership. The Tucson and TUSD communities are in your debt. Jason Free, TUSD teacher. And our last speaker tonight is Anna Crow. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Trujillo and lead counsel. I am writing to you all on the topic of money. My name is Anna Crow and I'm currently a school counselor. I understand that there were bonuses given this year to upper administration. For months, I have watched the CFO present the enormous losses of revenue we face this year and how the loss of jobs seems imminent, yet you gave, give this money so freely. I realize that I do not know everything about the way things are done in TUSD. However, it disheartens me that bonuses are given while school counselors are not only paid below other Arizona school district counselors, but we are required to work five days before school starts every year and paid nothing for that time. We do receive comp time. The time used versus the money that could be paid adds up, which in the end does not help our retirement. Anna Crow, school counselor. Thank you. And President Foster, that was our last speaker. Thank you, Ms. Counts. Board members, any comments to call to the audience? Ms. Foster? Yes, Ms. Cedric Gordon. I would like to, um, first of all, I, I would like to thank Ms. Devira and Ms. Fox, Fox for their kind words. But I also, and I've actually been meaning to do this for some time, completely aside from my leaving the board and their support um, for any individual board members, I do believe that Ms. Devira and Ms. Fox are some of the finest advocates um, that TUSD, some of the TUSD teachers and, and certainly the substitutes have seen. I think that our community is very lucky to have the two of you. Uh, sometimes our facts would uh, not always agree, but I, I truly appreciate your, your efforts and everything that you've managed to accomplish just simply by never giving up and always advocating on behalf of the teachers. And they're very, very lucky to have you. And I hope that you don't go anywhere and I would like to personally offer you my assistance in case you ever decide to run for the TUSC board or any other board or committee in town, you have my full support. So thank you to the both of you at, on behalf of all of the people that you've served, if I may. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Dr. Trujillo. Yes, I, our last speaker, um, I just wanna clarify the difference between a bonus and a stipend. The superintendent does not receive a bonus neither do any of the leadership team members. These are stipends that are a part of their annual contract. The governing board approves the contracts uh, every single uh, April and the, and the stipend for uh, unreimbursed expenses for 24 hour, seven day a week access, gas, all of that is part of the employee contract. It's not a performance bonus. Uh, my contract is public information uh, and it does include my uh, expense stipend for travel bonus. Uh, if you want to compare, and any member of the public can compare my salary as a superintendent with that of Mesa Schools, Deer Valley, Phoenix Union, or any of the comparable uh, other districts, I am the lowest paid amongst the top 
five largest school districts uh, in the district. And I say that with pride because my service here is not about the money, it's about my passion uh, and my love for this district. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Other board members? Okay. And with that, if I could just um, agree with Dr. Trujillo, and by law, we have to have a bonus, if you will, written into the superintendent's contract, and then we have to have perform, and it has to be a performance pay <clears throat> factor, if you will. And so the bonus that is part of Dr. Trujillo's contract is we have to incorporate um, data points and, and an evaluation. And so a portion of his pay then is attached to that performance. And I believe we reviewed that three or four months ago, if I'm correct. Okay, thank you for that. And with that, I will close call to the audience and we will move on to item 9.4. Dr. Trujillo, our, our census guests. Yes, um, thank you, President Foster, uh, members of the governing board. Uh, I'd like to um, welcome Maria Diane Valdez Cardenas from the U.S. Census Bureau. She's our partnership specialist that's been working with our schools in our district um, to make sure that the census, an important civic duty by all, uh, is widely communicated across the district. So I'd like to welcome her here this evening. Hello, Maria. Hello, thank welcome. You. Hello, hola. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gabriel Trujillo and the governing board for allowing us to be here tonight and give you some updates about the historical 2020 census we had. Um, and also to say thank you for all the support and all the efforts that uh, your um, office uh, put together to educate our families on the importance of the census. Uh, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of updates of how we are right now. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So we're gonna be, I'm gonna be presenting about the national recap, the regional recap, how we did in Arizona, what's next in 2021, and then some of the data services that we have for organizations and um, uh, local governments um, for uh, the data dissemination program. So can we go to the next? So um, the 2020 census, we had uh, some measuring responses rates. So nationwide, we did 67%, meaning 67% of the residents in United States and the five territories, they respond on their own, meaning um, online, on paper, or by phone. As you know, uh, the, this year was the first time that the census was available online. So the response rate, I mean, the response time, it was between five to nine minutes and people really prefer the internet 79.86 percent of the 67 percent prefer to do it online we didn't know we we're gonna have a pandemic but uh this was perfect for the census to uh people to do it from the comfort of their home uh we didn't have no data bridges and no downtime so the response rate in 2010 was 66.5 so we went over our own projected self-response rate so even though we went through a lot we 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 went over our own projected numbers so um can i go to the next So the non-response the non follow-up, meaning when people were not answering on their own, we sent enumerators to start knocking on doors. So on 2020, 64 million of, of those addresses were counted in 68-day period. In 2010, we did 47.2 million addresses in 69 days. So um, 
as on October 16 of 2020, a day after we finished with the census, we had 24.1% proxy, meaning we had it to go next to the um, neighbor and say, do you know how many people are living there? Are there kids? Are there females? Uh, how many there are there Hispanic? You know, just generic information. Um, so we use proxy for that. So it was a high number. Uh, we thought we were not gonna be using that a lot, but we did. We end up do, doing that in order for us to complete those addresses. Can I go to the next? So um, group quarters facilities, prisons, hospitals. Um, if you see the numbers here, uh, in 2020, we did increase a lot uh, comparing to 2010. Uh, the targeted not shelter outdoor locations, meaning parks um, outside of the Walmart in a parking lot, people living on the streets, people living under car. We count 37,000 locations nationwide. And the service-based enumeration, shelters, soup kitchens, um, places where uh, people were already staying um, uh, with, with uh, a base address. Um, we did 53,000 of those locations. So um, we really, really worked hard. Even though we were going through the pandemic, we make sure that we got all those locations counted. Um, can I go to the next? So um, we did have 313 partnerships, specialists like me, including tribal and media. Uh, we had 48,439 enumerators. And just to let you know, here in Southern Arizona, we had 1,385 in the beginning when we started with the enumeration in person and on August 1st. And then by the time we finished um, the census, we had all, almost 3,000 enumerators. And the reason was because here in Southern Arizona, the self-responses were not um, as we were projected. Uh, so we needed to bring people from the Washington State, uh, Los Angeles region. And we brought people from um, Chicago, uh, so to make sure that we did complete all those addresses. So we had 67,619 partners like you helping us to um, communicate and do a community outreach to um, have an awareness and motivate uh, residents to complete the census. We went through wildfires, social unrest, hurricanes, pandemic, PPE and all these new um, CD guidelines. So um, our enumerators were uh, trained and we complete our uh, numbers. Uh, we did have 50 area census offices, one here in Tucson covering all Southern Arizona. So we were glad that we had the opportunity to have one here in Tucson. Um, can I go to the next, please? <laughs> So this is the final numbers for um, the nation, Arizona, Pima County, City of Tucson, City of South Tucson. So in 2010, uh, people were only responding on paper. So they received the questionnaire and they, they had it to send it back uh, to us to do the counts. In 2020, we offer the internet, we offer the paper, and we also did the phone uh, calls. So if you see there, um, we improve in some areas. And um, the city of South Tucson actually did not improve. They finished minus 10.1% of their own self-response back in 2010. Um, we worked very hard. We had mobile questionnaire assistance. We were uh, helping people. We were we did canvassing. Uh, we we had plans of helping um, you know parents through the schools, but because all the uh, challenges that we we were all facing, we we didn't have the opportunity. To 
do that. So um, the city of Tucson barely made their own 2010 self-response. So um, we were a little bit, um, I was not disappointed, but I would say we were expecting the number to be uh, better. Um, and uh, so that that's why you see the reason there that in Pima County, we had it to bring more people from outside uh, to help us out to enumerate in person. So can I go to the next? So um, Arizona finished on 32 with 64.1, and our region covers 12 states. This is the states that we cover. Um, me, I cover all Southern Arizona. Uh, it's eight counties, including La Paz, and Yuma, and Greeley, and Graham, and Cochise, Pima, Santa Cruz, Pinal. Um, uh, so our one of our states, uh, the, is an origin finish number four, which is Nebraska with 71.9%. Um, can I go to the next? So this is what a lot of people are waiting for. What's going to be happening next in 2021? So the state population counts is projected to be released on December 31st um, because it's um, stated in the Constitution Institution that that's the date that the census has to release the, these numbers to the president. Um, the redistricting count um, we is going to be available in 2021, but we don't have an exact date yet. Um, the post enumeration survey saying um, it's happening right now, all the way to October 21st. So this is something we do after the decennial census, and it produced the undercount or overcount. So that would tell us if the city of Tucson um, or the city of South Tucson were undercount or overcount. So. Um, we we don't have a projected release number for that specific data collection um so hopefully it's going to be um in the beginning of 2022 so uh the ongoing monthly surveys is the american community survey that a lot of you guys use and utilize for um different programs and grants and Actually, that number from the 2019 American Community Survey is going to be released in two days, December 10th. So it's very important that um, your um, office that works in grants, you know, to have the um, ability to see those numbers um, based on the American Community Survey. We still people, the decennial census is over, but the census is still works um, every single month of every single year. Uh, so can I go to the next? So this is the some of the surveys that we do. Um, the the National Health Interview Survey is the one that we're doing right now during the pandemic. And it will tell um, the state and the county and the city how people are managing their daily lives during the pandemic. Um, the American Community Survey, like I said before, is the one that you know it will tell uh, the state and county and cities how your population is on social and economic issues, housing, transportation. So this is a very important one that a lot of people love to see the numbers. Um, can we go to the next? So this is a data dissemination program. Um, we do have a data dissemination specialist. They're the experts on data. So for the first time, we're, um, we're gonna be offering this training to organizations and entities and local governments about uh, it's, it's kind of like a training and how to access the data. And so you can, um, 
because we, we, we started seeing that people come to you, people come to your teachers, people come to your office staff, people come to your, um, your teacher aides and your community outreach person. They don't come to, to the census. So we wanna uh, train and offer this educational program for you. And, and that will be happening in the beginning of the spring if everything change or everything continues the same our date um is for the beginning of april but um it can change anytime but that's something that we offer and it's free um and we can do a virtual too so that's something that you guys can um, discuss if you guys would like to have it. A lot of the entities and local governments are asking for it because they want to learn how the census put together this data that affects the um, state population and the redistricting and the apportionment. Can I go to the next? So uh, we just want to say thank you for supporting the 2020 census. Um, Dr. Trujillo had uh, accepted the uh, invitation that I had for him to join me at the Arriba Tucson um, TV Azteca program. Uh, we, were, we were there every week educating and motivating the residents in Spanish um, to complete the census and understand why it's important. Uh, so your participation during the 20. 20 census was exceptional and it was trusted voices like yours that helped shape the future of our community for the next 10 years without your efforts this would have not been possible so we want to say thank you if i go to the next slide and the last one so the United States Census wants to say thank you to you. Um, we do, I do have, um, I don't know if you're willing to see me or if I can click the video. I just wanna present you the one that I have in my hands that I will be mailing out to you. And it's um, signed by our national director, recognizing Tucson Unified School District as an uh, um, invaluable member of the 2020 Census Community Partnership and Engagement Program, and that we appreciate the efforts in making the partnership program a success and helping achieve a success in historical 2020 Census. Thank you, Ms. Van Eyck Cardenas. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so it's here. You're gonna you're gonna be getting it in the mail. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I don't know if anybody has questions, but um, you got my information. And thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for all your hard work. I have a TUSD student at University High School, and I love to see the effort that every single teacher puts every morning to continue this um, education to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? All right. I appreciate the, the work is so important. It's so, so important. And some of those, I was glad to see Arizona in the middle. And I worry about New Mexico. And, and it's just so critical. It's so critical, the work that you, that um, everybody put into this. And thank you, Dr. Trujillo, for being such a strong partner with this. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to work with the U.S. Census Bureau. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy, please, Ms. Cardenas. Okay, Dr. Trujillo, we move on to the consent agenda. Yes, President Foster, board members, I present for your consideration and approval the consent agenda tonight as arranged, item 6.2 through 6.10. Special attention to item 6.3, I want to highlight tonight with your approval of the consent agenda. We approve an, an, an amazing instructional resource for teachers made possible through Nearpod educational platform, 9,000 ready to go instructional videos and activities and learning activities and lessons, uh, fully online and accessible, fully aligned to all major subjects in the district to our academic standards. Uh, will be an incredible resource for online learning for our teachers. And then also through Gizmos uh, Science Materials, uh, we will be purchasing tonight uh, thousands of online science projects and lab-based activities 
that will also be available for our uh, secondary teachers uh, in their attempts uh, to facilitate online learning for students in the natural and the earth sciences. So with that, I recommend approval tonight, your consideration of item 6.2 through item 6. Point, or item 6.10. All right, thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Board members, Ms. Grijalva. I'll move the item. Second. Okay, so the agenda has been moved by Ms. Grijalva and seconded by Mr. Burke. Are there any questions, board members? Ms. Foster? Yes, Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Uh, I would actually like, I suppose, uh, I'm not, I don't have to apologize since it's, uh, it's not too far out of character for me on the board, but I would like to go ahead and remove item 6.3. 6.4 and 6.10 from the consent agenda. I'm afraid I can't support these items at this time. Um, for item 6.3 and 6.4, although I understand, Dr. Trujillo, that it could be exciting for teachers with Nearpod and with Gizmos, um, I would love to have seen how these two items fit into the larger curriculum. I know that we spend a great deal of time and money on curriculum, on our de curriculum department, uh, I know the teachers are constantly creating curriculum, creating videos, and I don't see, based on the information that we've been given, how those two items fit into the puzzle, if you will, of TUSD's curriculum. Um, and so for those, those three items, I wonder if we can remove those from, from the consent agenda and vote separately on those. Thank so you. It was item 6.3 and 6.4? Mm -hmm. And 6.10 as well. Okay, can you talk to that one? Sure, I'm not prepared to support that item at this moment. Okay, Ms. Grijalva. Yeah, I, I'll accept a friendly amendment to omit those three and we can vote on them separately. Second. Okay, and so we have the consent agenda, six, one, two, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, if I could have a, we'll just have everybody vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, so those items pass five to zero. All right, item 6.3. Yes, I can ask uh, Heidi, uh, uh, Ms. Heidi Aranda, our Senior Director for Curriculum Development uh, to answer any questions about Nearpod, uh, along with our Assistant Superintendent for curriculum and instruction, Mrs. Flory Hewitt. Before I pass it over, Ms. Um, Sedwick Gordon, can we do 6.3 and 6.4 together? Would that be possible to have those two items presented to us and then we could vote on those together? Yeah, I think that makes good sense in the name of time. And I also have um, a uh, sort of administrative question for uh, Ms. Ben and Ms. Um, Gutierrez with the item that's up right now on our screen. <laughs> Does that include, if I press yes on this, does that mean I voted for those items minus the ones that I wanted to remove? Ms. Sedwick, Gordon, um, I've corrected the motion and I've, uh, I'm, I was typing while you guys were talking and I put Dr. Trujillo recommends approval of the consent agenda item 6.2, 6.5, 6.6, 6.7, 6.8, 6.9, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 
a, an activity, a sorting activity. Sometimes it allows them to give open responses to questions. So it really is more about instruction. It's an instructional tool. We put it in as supplemental curriculum approval because it does have a bank of lesson plans, videos, and some instructional tools that teachers can use. I mean, curriculum um, content that teachers can use um, to supplement their curriculum. But it really is about um, the instruction. It's about making the instruction interactive. Um, there are you know, 11 different types of formative assessments that they can embed um, within the lesson. It also allows teachers to do both synchronous and asynchronous lessons. Um, so it allows them to prepare a lesson that kids can do asynchronously as well as make do live lessons. Um, it allows teachers to collaborate with each other. So um, a teacher can share a lesson or a Nearpod um, that they have created with another teacher. There are um, school libraries of lessons that so teachers can, can develop their own library of lessons as well as district libraries of lessons. So it really is about providing teachers more support and let, you know, uh, lessons that are um, ready to go and align to our curriculum. So it really is more of an instructional tool, although there are pieces of curriculum that are available there for teachers to use. Thank you for the, the explanation. I, I appreciate it very much. I think my, my concern is, it, it sounds like a fantastic piece of software. My concern really has to do more with whether, so if TUSD purchases this software, how will teachers know that it's available to them? Uh, yeah. And why would they, after they've spent a semester or a quarter or a year creating their own materials and all of these videos, et cetera, um, so, I'm not sure why they would turn to this software, even though the software might make their jobs easier. The time that I spent teaching, uh, I was always so busy with what I was doing that there was a lot less time to go through all of the resources that the district, for example, might have provided. And I think in this case, the idea that I'm left with is that TUSD has provided a large number of resources to our teachers. The teachers don't always know that those resources are available. If they do know that they're available, they're not sure why they're available uh, because it seems like work that the district is doing that teachers have already done and so I, 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 uh, I know that you're an expert in all of this curriculum stuff and I absolutely believe that you found a place for this software in the curriculum. My question is about the teachers, right? And whether they know whether there is that place for this and I'm not sure that it's possible for them to know that at this time, given the issues that TUSD has suffered in communication and so despite your um, tremendously informative presentation, I'm not gonna be able to support this item this evening, um, but, but thank you very much for the explanation. And I do wanna clarify that actually this came as a result of teacher requests, site requests. Um, currently our AVID teachers are using this within the district as well as a few other programs teachers, um, we have thousands, uh, hundreds of teachers already using the free version of this, which doesn't allow them to save their lessons. It, it limits their storage and it doesn't allow them to um, access the content that's there. It just allows them to make a Nearpod. Um, so this request actually came from the teachers. Um, and we we started investigating whether, because I, I was not familiar with Nearpod and uh, before the teachers actually introduced it to me. Um, the other item um, is really an item for sixth and seventh grade teachers that we want to provide with professional development. When it comes to the science, um, this is the gizmos one. Sixth and seventh grade, um, although we were able to, to really align the curriculum and provide resources, they have a lot less digital resources than the other grade levels. And so this was a way to, through professional development, provide them with a tool 
um, that is digital that um, they can do labs with in science. So it was really to fill a gap um, that currently exists digitally for sixth and seventh grade. Other did, did, was somebody else going to present or talk about this, Dr. Trujillo? Or? That's it. We've, we've presented all our information on the site, and we also have detailed information inside of the BAI. Uh, we've gone through the supplementary material public review process as well. All right, Ms. Grijalva and Mr. Burke, I both see your mutes off. Who would like to go first? I'll move the item. Second. Okay, so the item has been moved by Ms. Grijalva and seconded by Mr. Burke. And Dr. Trujillo, I just want to thank you because when we met and had our one-on-one, -on -one, I we talked about this and then I was able to learn more about it. And then once, you know, when, when you hear about something and then you start hearing it everywhere. And so I've heard people talking about Nearpod all over and I think it's it's the right, right move. So thank you for that. And President I'll Foster, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Counts. Is this a annual cost that we're going to have to renew each year? <clears throat> Dr. Trujillo. We don't have to renew it each year, but it's available to be, they're, they're all one year agreements. We're okay. under no obligation to continue it. So this, this just gets us through one year, this cost? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering then about training in it because it, it's close to $100,000. $100,000 every year can add up quickly. So I want our teachers to feel comfortable and have access to this. So what kind of professional development or um, are we going to be providing our teachers on it? Yes. So if approved tonight, we um, are assigned a customer success uh, manager. Um, and we have a, we will meet with them next week to develop, we, part of the package I think that is in your board docs also includes professional development. So um, we will add, we will work with the customer success specialist to, or manager to develop that plan um, to provide PD starting in January. Okay. President Foster, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, if this does pass tonight, um, can I ask that next year uh, we get a presentation along with this renewal, um, the contract to renew um, on success and how teachers are using it and getting feedback and um, in numbers too, data, how many, how many classrooms are actually using it and with what frequency? Absolutely. Okay, Definitely. thank you. Ms. Grijalva, you had a hand up earlier? Yeah, just to clarify the item numbers so the public understands what we're... 6.3 and 6.4. Thank you. And I had asked if it was okay if we voted for those together, so I believe we're still yep. doing that. That's fine. Ms. Foster? Yes, Ms. Sedwick-Gordon. Uh, just to conclude, I'm, I'm tempted to vote for the item after listening to Ms. Aranda and, and hearing that it actually came from the teachers. However, I'm gonna to stick to my guns. I'm not gonna vote for these items only because I think that it's really very important that for TUSD, when it comes time to presenting curriculum and resources to the board or to the teachers or the community in, at large, um, it's really important that we start to show the community that we know what we're doing in terms of curriculum, right? Because an awful lot of public resources are dedicated to curriculum and instruction. And so I think that it's really important that TUSD does not do this in a piecemeal fashion and does not do it in a way that even seems piecemeal. Um, and so it, it sounds like the curriculum, there's a great, been a great deal of thought that maybe this came from the teachers, that the teachers really want this. Um, I would have appreciated a little bit more information about how these, these specific items fit into the larger picture, because even though it's only $65,000, that money, as Ms. Counts pointed out, it really does add up. And when the new board comes on in, Janu in January and they're going to be asked to make very difficult decisions, I think that they will appreciate knowing that the boards before them did things in a very um, strategic, focused manner. And so for that reason, I'm not gonna support these items tonight, but um, I hope that doesn't, you know, that's not an insult to your uh, level of expertise or your choices because it's not, that it's not, I'm not trying to criticize those things. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions or comments on 6.3 and 6.4? Okay, I'll ask for a roll call vote, please. And then we will go vote online and um, just assure that whichever button we push yes or no for right now was for both 6.3 and 6.4. Ms. Counts? Yes. Ms. Grijalva? Yes. Ms. Sedwick Gordon? No. Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Item passes 4.1 with Ms. Sedwick Gordon opposing. Okay. And I don't see that popping up on our screen, so I assume they've taken care of that. And we move to item 6.10, Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Let's see. Oh, there it goes. Now we've got it on our screen. Okay. Yes, I do not support this item. And for that reason, I would like to vote on it separately from the other items. That's where we are right now, item 6.10. And I would like to vote on it separately because I don't support it. Um, for one reason, it, it based on our, this is executive session discussion. However, I understand that these documents will become public once the board takes a vote on the matter. And I would like to um, communicate to the public that I do not agree with the uh, with, with this item going forward. Okay, Ms. Grijalva. I'd like to move the item. Second. Okay, the item has been moved by Ms. Grijalva and seconded by Mr. Burke. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Gutierrez. Ms. Counts. Yes. Ms. Grijalva? Yes. Ms. Sedwick Gordon? No. Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Item passes 4 to 1 um, with Ms. Sedwick Gordon um, voting no. Okay. Next item is item 7.1, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, uh, President uh, Foster board members, um, I'd like to welcome our regional assistant superintendent um, for uh, service that, that serves over the, the UHS uh, region uh, to talk a little bit about some modifications to the admissions program that are going to be recommended uh, in light of COVID-19, largely regarding testing. And so I also want to welcome our attorney for the desegregation case uh, Mr. Bruce Converse will also be joining us remotely. I think we may also have Sam Brown uh, to talk about the UHS uh, temporary one-year admissions modification proposal. Mr. Rose. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Uh, President Foster, governing board members, Dr. Trujillo and Mr. Ross. Um, we are coming today to, for your consideration, the University High School admissions modification for the 2021-2022 the school year. Next slide. The full seventh grade COGAT testing in the spring of 2020 was suspended because of school closures. Um, our plan was to uh, test those uh, students who are now eighth graders in the fall of 2020. But due to the pandemic uh, continuing, to continuing to worsen, uh, we have had to come up with an alternative uh, for our admissions to University High School for our ninth graders that will be entering in the fall of 2021. Um, to go over that alternative measure, I'm going to ask Dr. Friedis uh, to present that information. And shortly after Dr. Friedis uh, is, is finished, I'm going to ask that our, our DSEG attorney, uh, Bruce Converse, uh, talk to us about next steps. So with no, no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Friedis. Jim Foster. Ms. Sedwick and um, Mr. Burke for your dedication and service to TUSD and to the larger community. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, the alternate measure. So we wanted to use an existing measure because of safety concerns about large scale testing um, during 
during COVID because we have so many students while we are in remote learning and the idea of having a proctored test uh, just didn't seem feasible to us um, at this time. So we decided we are proposing for this year only to use the most recent AZ merit scores, which are sixth grade in ELA and math. And uh, so what we did was we developed a model of um, using AZ merit scores that approximates the COGAT scores. And then we tested it against the prior three years of qualifying students. And what we found was that the model performed quite well and that it produced comparable student numbers and comparable ethnic diversity. So all the other admissions criteria will stay the same. It's, it's only the alternative from AZ Merit to COGAT that we're proposing for this year because of, because of COVID. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we do have a small number of students who don't have a sixth grade AZ merit score and a GPA of 3.0 or higher in their core courses. And so what we will do with these students is we will work very closely with um, the middle school's leadership teams as well as the equity and diversity department to find an appropriate way to test these students uh, safely, either individually or in small groups. And uh, because it's such a small number, we feel that that's really doable and we can do it over the spring. And um, we um, want to make sure that we get all of these students uh, tested because um, we want to make sure that all, all students have an opportunity to test for UHS. Okay, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I just want to um, say that this is a one year only measure and it's out of necessity really. And that next year we plan fully to go back to the COGAT full grade testing. And, um, and so our goal is with the AZ Merit um, alternative measure and the modeling that we've done that we will produce an incoming class with comparable diversity and size as, as prior years. Um, Mr. Rose, with that, I, I'm, I conclude my part of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Friedis. Um, we're, we're now gonna turn it over to Mr. Converse to uh, talk about next steps um, because there, we're going to have to um, submit this to the courts for approval. So, Mr. Converse. Thank you, President Foster, members of the board, uh, Superintendent and uh, Dr. Freitas and, and uh, Mr. Rose. Uh, let me just first, uh, before we talk about next steps, report to you all that we submitted this alternative proposal to uh, both the plaintiffs in the desegregation case and the special master. And I want to report to you briefly on the comments and, and responses that we got. And if, if any of you wish to see them directly, that's fine, we can provide them to you. First of all, the special master reported that he endorses this procedure as a one-year process to ensure that students uh, receive opportunities similar to those that were provided uh, that were provided previously. We, uh, the Department of Justice has no objection to this procedure. Uh, the Mendoza plaintiffs have no objection, but they expressed two concerns. One, they wanted to make sure that, uh, that there was extended outreach to members of the various uh, ethnic and racial groups that had no current score uh, that would, that would uh, the AZ merit that would qualify and thus would have to take the COGAT to make sure there was no slip between, uh, you know, between the opportunity to test and the actual test. And as you heard from Dr. Freitas, we're already, the district had already started doing that and the numbers are sufficiently small that we believe that's not gonna be a problem and that we'll, we will be able to do ex extensive outreach to that small group of students to make sure that everybody gets a chance to test. 
that's obviously what we do normally. We normally provide a test or test everyone in the seventh grade for possible admission to UHS. And then um, lastly, they, they were a bit concerned that we expressed our goal as doing only as well as last year in terms of the demographics. But the, the, the key here is we wanted to do no harm. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, of the various options, we chose one that, that did the best at reproducing at least as good demographics. Long term, of course, we want to work on improving the diversity of UHS, and that doesn't deflect us from that goal. It's just that in these uh, current times, we're, we're, we're desperately trying to make sure we don't do harm. And I think we've, we've achieved that in the, in the current circumstances. And now to what Mr. Rose indicated uh, was, was important for you to hear, and that's next steps. Uh, the next steps is to submit this on an expedited basis for approval by the court. Once that is, if in fact you do vote to approve this, if you if you approve it, our next step would be to ask the court for approval on an expedited basis, and hopefully that will allow the uh, the community, the parents, the students, and and the schools to be able to implement this policy in a timely manner and make sure that our incoming class is both diverse. Uh, but um, but fully worthy of uh, of the great UHS tradition that we have. And thanks very much. And before I turn it over again, I also want to say briefly uh, to President Foster and Ms. Sedgwick and um, Mr. Burke how much I have truly benefited and enjoyed from your service as a board. It's been an honor to serve with you, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Converse. I this back to Dr. Trujillo or Mr. Rose? Yes, that, that concludes our, our presentation. Okay. Dr. Trujillo, any? Yes, we, I am, uh, of course, uh, the administration is fully supportive of this proposal. Uh, as uh, Dr. Freitas noted, it's a one year only. Your approval tonight is a crucial step towards the, the um, ultimate goal of court approval uh, so that we can enact this one-year adjustment uh, in time for enrollment season and selection over at UHS for the upcoming school year. So a yes vote would provide modified criteria, uh, criteria for UHS admissions for 21-22 due to the pandemic. Yes, it would, and it would send us on the road to that crucial process of court approval. Okay, questions, board members? Questions or comments? Ms. Foster? Uh, yes, Ms. Cedric Gordon. At first, I would like to say thank you to Mr. Converse and to Mr. Rose. I do believe uh, both of you gentlemen came on after 2017, <laughs> so I can take some pride in the fact that you are working for and with the district. Um, so thank you for your efforts, and I would like to go ahead and move the item. I'd like to second. Okay, so the item has been moved by Ms. Sedwick Gordon and seconded by Ms. Counts. And Ms. Grijalva, you had your hand up, and I'm sorry that people jumped in over that, but Ms. Grijalva. No, that's okay. I have a question, actually. So yeah. as the uh, parent of an uh, eighth grader, I really appreciate this because that was something that we kept getting all these notifications from the middle school and how we were going to do this and if we don't want my child to come on campus. I mean, I really do feel that this we had to figure uh, another solution out. So I do appreciate that. There are other um, high schools that want access to COGAT information. And I just wanna make sure that that is a district decision to share as opposed to something that's only limited to UHS. Absolutely, we, we wanna make that commitment. It's very important that we don't just grow advanced learning experiences at UHS. We wanna see advanced learning experiences, more specifically AP offerings and dual enrollment offerings grow at every single district high school. So I think that it's crucial that we share that data. Uh, we hope to see more high schools go the route of Pueblo and establish uh, academies, cohorts of students taking advanced learning experience courses, coming in at ninth grade and having a four-year program. And I think that that COGAT data is key uh, in being able to support that growth. 
Yeah, and I think that, you know, Choya and the IB program, I mean, there are other programs and, and any high school that really, I think, wants to be able to look to see what their students that would traditionally be going into their feeder pattern, what are the kinds of classes or um, experiences that they want, I think this information is helpful. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And so we can just let the other high schools know that all of this information will be available um, to all of the high schools and not just UHS. I, I think that that's beneficial. Dr. Burke, you have your mute button off. Did you have a question or a comment? I'm just prepared to vote. Okay, I, I do have a question, Dr. Trujillo. If a student is coming from outside of Arizona and they don't have an AZ merit score, how would we handle that scenario? I will defer to Mr. Rose and Dr. Freitas on that. Dr. I'm hesitant to say that we would use this state's equivalent exam, but I'm not sure. Yes, Dr. Freitas, you want to talk about that? We did discuss that, and that is part of yeah. our plan. So anyone who doesn't have a sixth grade easy merit score will take the COGAT. And so that goes for um, both our in-district and out-of-district students. And so any student who comes from out-of-state wouldn't have an easy merit score, so then they would take the COGAP in its place. All right, we had questions and comments, and we had a first and a second. And um, I don't see, I don't feel any opposition, so I'm just going to ask for all those in favor say aye. 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 And anybody opposed? Okay, item passes five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Rose and Dr. Thank you. and Mr. Thank Connors. you. Thank you, Board. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freitas. Yes, thank you. Okay, item 7.2, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, item 7.2 is a very, very special treat that we have uh, for you this evening as a governing board. And uh, assisting me uh, this evening, we've got some guests. So first, uh, I would like to welcome, and I'll save our guest of honor for last, uh, but I'd like to welcome um, our uh, guests uh, assisting us tonight with this presentation. We have the principal from Saguaro High School, Mr. Estrella, who will actually be doing the official honors, at least uh, virtually. Uh, we have uh, retired Colonel Wanda Wright from the Arizona Department of Veterans Services. She's the director. Uh, for services of the Arizona Department of Veterans Affairs. We have Cameron Johnson uh, from the Arizona Department of Veterans Services and Community Partnership. He's the program manager for that uh, program. And uh, we have, last but not least, our guest of honor tonight is Saguaro High School class of 1967, Mr. Clyde Rocky Brown. And tonight, we uh, proudly step forward and award him a long-awaited diploma. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about this real-life American hero who cut Please. short his educational time at Saguaro High School to answer the call of service overseas during the Vietnam War. Rocky Brown, Clyde Rocky Brown, was born March 11, 1950, native of San Diego, California. He was the oldest of four sons. In 1967, at the tender age of 17, he cut short his junior year at Saguaro, and left early in order to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. Mm. Ooh, me, let me, lost my place here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the screen share came up, I, I lost my, my, my talking points here. So um, in 1967, of course, he cut short his junior year at Saguaro uh, for the purposes of answering the call and enrolling in the United States. In, enrolling in the United States uh, Marine Corps. After his enlistment, he was called to serve overseas because he wanted to join the fight in Vietnam to protect the Republic of South Vietnam for its imminent fall before the war passed him by. After enlisting, Rocky was trained as an aviation hydraulic specialist, and in 1968, he arrived in country, landing in Da Nang, Vietnam, where he was assigned to service in the Flying Tiger Squadron. He directly supported the F-4 Phantoms, which conducted ground support and bombing missions. During his tour in Vietnam, Rocky survived constant mortar attacks and small arms fire and attacks in a massive enemy bombing campaign that destroyed several buildings on the base that he was assigned. 
Inevitably, after a rocky service in Vietnam, you would move on to serve in Okinawa, Japan, Philippines. And in 1977, the rank of sergeant, he separated from the United States Marine Corps. And his 10-year career resulted in numerous awards and medals to include the Vietnamese Commendation Medal and the Vietnam Gallantry Cross Medal with Palm, which is conferred upon a unit for deeds of valor and conspicuous acts of gallantry and courage and heroism while engaging and fighting the enemy. For his time in the United States Marine Corps, Rocky spent many years in the aerospace industry and ultimately took a job, retired from the University of Iowa. Rocky has five children from his previous marriages and has been married to the love of his life, Kathy, for almost 19 years. Come here back, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> I think we see her uh, on camera. It yeah. is my honor, not only as the superintendent of the Tucson Unified School District, but also as the proud son of a Vietnam veteran and also a proud son indebted to the Arizona Department of Veterans Affairs that, that has provided throughout my lifetime vital physical and emotional health services and benefits to my own father. And I know it's done the same for the Brown family. So it's my honor in these roles to be able to turn it over to principal, current principal of uh, Sawaro High School, who probably was just the, the first or second grader at the time, of uh, Mr. Brown, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, journey to Paris Island, and his enlistment in the Marine Corps. But now the current principal of Sawaro that will do the duties, uh, Principal uh, Roberto Estrella of Sawaro High School, to officially speak to the conferring of the honorary, di honorary diploma from Sawaro High School to Mr. Clyde Rocky Brown, Mr. Estrella. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Trio, uh, members of the governing board. Um, thank you again for joining us today in this great celebration, this long awaited celebration. Um, Mr. Brown, just speaking to you directly, it's a great night to be a Cougar. And so I'm very proud of the, the service you've done for our country. And I'm very proud of, to see that your, your loved ones are behind you and joining you today. And I'm proud to, to, to help assist and recognize and, and issue you this diploma virtually to you um, on behalf of Swarrow High School and TUSD. Um, uh, Mrs. Wright and Mr. Johnson, I'd also like to thank you guys as well for uh, you and the, and the good people at the Arizona Veterans Services for the advocacy of you done to help get this night going and, uh, and for the continued work that you do for all veterans in the state. But again, tonight, Mr. Brown, this is your night. Congratulations and thank you again for your services. Thank you. So I would like to now present, I'm Wanda Wright, the director for the Arizona Department of Veteran Services to, to um, give this di diploma to um, <laughs> Mr. Brown for um, the great work and service that he did in the military. And to say that we are so honored to be able to present this to you today we are so happy to acknowledge this last year of your high school year. <laughs> I know it's a, but we it's understand. It's been a long year. <laughs> yes, but we understand that the experience that you had in the military is worth more than that. Well, thank you very much. And we thank, thank you, you so much for that. I do thank need you. you to hold that for a second because we actually need to vote. And I want to extend this a little bit, if that's okay. If I could have a motion to present this honorary high school diploma from Saguaro board members. I move. And I'll second that. Ms. Grijalva moves the item and I second the item and I'm going to extend it even more, you know, cause we, we got to celebrate. And so I would like a roll call vote please for Sergeant Brown. Ms. Counts? Yes. Ms. Grijalva? Yes. Ms. Sedwick Gordon? Yes. Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Item passes five to zero. There's no opposition to this. We, we honor you and thank you. And we just voted to, before we hand it over, we had to vote. And so I'll let you continue <laughs> handing over that diploma. Congratulations. And, and we'd really like to thank from our the, the department, we'd really like to thank the Tucson Unified School District for this collaboration to make this presentation. Go ahead, Rocky. 
Well, I would like to thank everybody that's been a part of this. It's been a very interesting process, and uh, the people that are here in my home are wonderful, and I appreciate the school board sincerely. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Because I'm keeping it short. <laughs> School board members, any comments for, for Sergeant Graduate Brown? Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I was proud to do it. And I and I thank you too. On my father's headstone, it proudly says Korea and Vietnam. And so I thank you for your service very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And stay safe and healthy, please. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes hard. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful holiday season as well. You too, and everybody on the board, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Brown. All right, Dr. Trujillo, item 7.3. Yes, item 7.3. I'd like to welcome forward our team from Planning Services, uh, Mr. Nodin, uh, and I believe Mr. Ballesteros are both standing by. Uh, we have a request for governing board approval to purchase the Hohoka Middle School site uh, from the Bureau of Land Management. Gentlemen. Mr. Trujillo, members of the board, uh, and uh, Mr. Ross, we uh, closed Hohoka Middle School in 2013, and unlike some of the other sites, we didn't sell it or lease it. There was a couple of reasons we didn't. First of all, we felt it would be needed in the near future. Uh, there was a lot of growth in the southwest area. Um, and then also, we hold a federal patent on the land um, that the school sits on. And that patent is like a lease. It controls the use of the site. So although in 1987 and the mid-90s funded construction of uh, a full 100,000 square foot facility, its use is still subject to the federal patent to that lease. So recently we were looking at that area in Hohokam again, and uh, we discovered some key points. First of all, we don't feel that Hohokam will be needed in the near term but may be needed uh, in the long term in the future. And that's why back in October, we leased it to the Pasquayaki tribe for 10 years so that they could use it, uh, invest in it, improve it. Uh, they're going to invest 1.4 million in it uh, and maintain it during the lease. And we did work with the Bureau of Land Management, which, which is our federal representative to get that lease approved. Now, the downside of all of that, not needing the school soon is that per the patent, uh, continued non-use by the district for five years could result in losing the facility. And that facility is worth five to seven million. Um, plus, we might have to return the land to its original condition, uh, which would involve demolition of the facility. So with the cooperation of the tribe and Congress, um, we work to get a federal law passed that allows us to buy out the patent, buy out the lease, by paying for just the value of the land as if it was vacant. And um, the value of the land is about 10 times less than the, the, uh, than the facility itself. So um, we're looking, the proposal tonight is to do that. And uh, we have to indicate to the BLM our intent to purchase by December 19th, so just this next week. So the resolution in your packet uh, proposes the adoption of the plan for a hokum and direct submission of a letter of intent to purchase to the BLM. Great. Thank you, Mr. Nodin. Dr. Trujillo, would you like to make any comments before I open it up to the board? Yes, I would like to note just a couple of items. Um, first, the purchase of this uh, property, we will be utilizing plant funds. And plant funds are uh, funds that are generated from revenue from the sale or lease or rental of district properties. And they're, they're earmarked. You cannot really use them in any other capacity other than for capital deferred maintenance, uh, buying capital equipment. So it's not like plant funds can be used in other areas of the district budget. 
Uh, secondly, the sale for uh, Corbett is still pending, and the intention is to use the proceeds from the sale of Corbett to finance, which is plant fund revenue, uh, incoming plant fund revenue, which would be used to finance the purchase of Hohokam uh, for this particular proposal. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. So we couldn't take money from Corbett and use that for salaries? No, that's those are restricted funds that uh, go into the plant fund. And of course, the governing board has its own policy that requires it to spend 20% of its plant fund every year. And that's why we, as a yearly function, we always come before the board with a list of proposed capital projects that uh, all of you vote on. Okay, thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? Mr. Burke. I'll move the item for approval. <clears throat> Ms. Grijalva. I'll second, and then I have a comment. Okay, so the item was moved by Mr. Burke and seconded by Ms. Grijalva in your comment. Yeah, I just um, wanted to remind the board and the community that we did want to have, um, we had to ask permission, the BLM, to use the site for one of the proposed um, collaborations with the tribe, and we were denied. Um, and so I think that it's important for us to be able to have the flexibility. And the other piece of this is if we choose not to use the facility and continue to leave it, you know, in the same kind of um, sort of in limbo, the way we've had it for the last few years since we closed Hohokam, the BLM can ask us to return the site to its previous condition, which means that we, the district, would have to raise and and knock down and take all of the debris away in order to like put the land back into its original condition when we had it. And that's a significant expense. So I would rather have the facility be able to use it, be able to work with the tribe and other agencies in order to provide um, access to Hohokam in the hope that we will need the um, site again. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Nodin, how much would that cost if we were to have to graze the whole land and return it without a building? It would be about 1 point, uh, about 1 million, 800,000 at least, and probably closer to a million. And remind us of tonight's purchase price. Uh, the purchase price is uh, $480,000 based on an appraisal that we worked on with the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or mm -hmm. comments, board members? Because we have a, a first, we have an item that's ready. Ms. Foster. Yes, Ms. Sedwick Gordon. I think that this looks like this is a fantastic idea. It's a no brainer and it's a way for the district to save about half a million dollars and also maintain this gorgeous site in this fantastic location. Um, the item has already been moved, yes? Yes. Okay. Yep, we have a move by Mr. Burke and seconded by Ms. Grijalva. And so with that, I don't feel any opposition to this item. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item passes five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Nodin, for all your work with that. Okay, item 7.4, Dr. Trujillo. President Foster, board members, some really, really good news. Um, we're bringing forward for your consideration a grant award to the district of almost $90,000 uh, to support our holiday meals program. I'd like to invite Mrs. Lindsay Aguilar uh, to speak a little bit about this grant that uh, we're going to be asking for your approval of. Good evening, President Foster, board members, Dr. Trujillo. Um, I'm here tonight to request approval of a Nourishing Neighbors grant of $89,000 from Albertson's Companies Foundation. Um, this grant, um, we propose this um, funding to provide additional um, money so that we could provide um, extra food for our families for the holiday through uh, produce boxes that feature local um, produce items uh, accompanied with nutrition education resources to our families. So we're seeking approval um, so we can get hopefully get this moving and utilize these funds for our families um, during winter break and also into January. Great, thank you, Ms. Aguilar. 
Board members. Ms. Grijalva. Yeah, these competitive grants are really um, difficult to get, and so and they're also in high demand. So congratulations, and I would love to move the item. Do we have a second? I'll second. I get the item. Okay, I think Mr. Burke will give that to Ms. Sedwick. He threw up his hands. He said she can have it. So Ms. Grijalva <laughs> moves the item, and Ms. Sedwick Gordon seconds. And again, I want to. Congratulate you, Ms. Aguilar, because they're, they're not just handing out money right now. We got to work for this. So congratulations. Any other questions or comment, board members? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Item passes five to zero. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. Thank you very much. Have a safe and wonderful holiday. You as well. Happy holidays. And thank you all for your service for those of you that are leaving. It's been a pleasure serving you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Trujillo, item 7.5. Yes, uh, President Foster, board members, one of the annual functions of our budget process is to submit uh, any budget revisions the district may need by December 18th uh, to the Arizona Department of Education. And of course, uh, lost revenue because of the loss of funding due to both decline in enrollment, the amount of students taking online instruction have of course resulted in a budget revision. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our director, executive director for finance, uh, Renee Weatherless. Thank you, President Foster, members of the governing board, Dr. Trujillo and Council Ross. Um, tonight, we are here to revise our fiscal 2021 budget. Um, next slide, please. So on any given school year, we are required once a year to revise our budget. It's due to, to ADE by May 15th. Um, however, if we submit an adopted budget that varies from current year funding in excess of 1%, then you get that letter that's a snapshot of it, the expenditure analysis letter, which we did receive as a district on, on October 23rd. Um, it's due to our decline enrollment. Um, so the recalculated budget was actually less than our adopted by $10 million. So we are required to submit a budget back to ADE by December 15th. Um, next slide, please. So what we did was um, we had to obviously reduce our average daily membership based on where our enrollment is right now. Um, one of the other things that I factored into this estimate is that I am assuming 100 days of distance learning. Um, so that is um, because it is funded at 95% or 85%, depending on full-time, part-time status. and we know that we had to recode some of our m and expenditures to the Enrollment Stability Grant. So our Enrollment Stability Grant total award was 15.2 million. As you know, we had originally um, estimated it would be 20.5. It came in at less than that. Um, we did code some of our fiscal 20 expenditures to the tune of 6.8. So the remainder of that award is 8.4 million, and that's what we will be recoding in this fiscal year out of MNO and into the grant. And then just managing our district's funding plan to make sure that we can um, meet our budget expectations. So next slide, please. Um, average daily membership was originally submitted at 41,638. Um, there's a snapshot on the next slide that will show you the link to the current um, December ADM, which is 39,614. Next slide, please. Um, here's a snapshot of that report and the link where the public can access those reports. Next slide, please. So the two numbers that are changing in this budget, um, you know, with the budget, we have m and and capital, which are levy funds. We have all other grants and um, other local and, and federal funding. But tonight, all we're revising is our m and and capital. So those are the only two items that you're going to see. I did notice that the forms themselves, which do need to be signed, um, were omitted and they should get posted shortly. Um, so our December revision for maintenance and operation, it was 331 million in the adopted budget. It is now going to be revised down to 322. So the difference is $8,400,000. Um, 
So one of the things I want to make sure that people understand is that our budget reduction is not just 8.4. We have to remember that we carried forward um, a total of $13 million in m &O. That's offsetting our enrollment loss. So if you just look at our enrollment losses and our distance learning losses combined, we're talking about just under $23 million. So that is something that we will have to address going forward. Um, so when you see a budget reduction of only eight, that is not our, our total that we have to, to look to. Um, we did carry forward 13, over $13 million. So we are going to be recoding the $8.4 million to m and So that's going to leave just slightly um, over $50,000 left at this point in time. Um, next slide, please. So when you take the m and and you break it down between DSEG and non-DSEG, uh, 8.3 of it is non-DSEG, and the difference that you see in DSEG m and is not a reduction or a change. What it is is DSEG in total is 63. Excuse me, 0.7 million dollars, and that money can be moved back and forth between m and and capital. So you'll see that that amount was transferred um, to capital. Next slide, please. So on the capital side, we did actually see some positive news. Um, there was some capital that because of COVID, we were unable to spend in the fiscal 20 year. So our carry forward came in a little bit higher than we had originally estimated when we submitted the adopted budget. So that's a good thing. Um, and so we have that to be able to add. Next slide, please. And the breakdown between capital on DSEG and m and again, is the carry forward balance that you're seeing between non-DSEG capital. And on the DSEG side, that's the same 52,000 um, that was transferred uh, into m and And next slide, please. So the, um, as I said, the forms, the actual budget forms with all of the values and, and the estimates and, and reports will be uploaded um, to the BAI and that summary form would need to be signed. Otherwise, that is all I have for tonight. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Weatherless. Board members, any? And so again, we have to uh, vote that we see this work has been done. Correct. And when is the deadline for the submission of this? December 15th. Okay, thank you. Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, I know that um, I just, I wanna clarify a couple of points, you know, especially for those watching in public. So, so number one, when Renee talks about $13 million that we carried forward from last year, that's not district generated money. Okay, that wasn't a surplus of money. That was as a result of monies that we received through what's known as the ESSER grant, elementary, school, elementary and secondary schools economic recovery uh, as part of the CARES Act legislation that awarded the district $18.5 million to cover COVID-19 related pandemic costs, okay? So the money that we carried over from the previous fiscal year was strictly those dollars. Those dollars had to be immediately thrown uh, at the almost uh, $23 million loss of revenue that Renee referenced in terms of the roughly 2,600 students um, that we, that uh, 26 fewer students that we have in the district, our enrollment loss, as well as the 5% reduction in funding we're taking right now for every single student that is in remote learning. What this means is next year, there's no guarantee that we're going to have what's known as ESSER money. Again, when we say ESSER, elementary and secondary schools economic recovery money, there's no guarantee. So without a guarantee, we're facing at best the very same $23 million deficit as we head into budget building for 21-22. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, board members. Ms. Cedric Gordon. Uh, just very quickly, thank you for the information. At all, as always, it was very helpful. I do want to point out that when I first got on the board, the finance support department was under constant fire from the community. And at board members, many different community members would come and they would complain about what was going on in the finance department. And Ms. Weatherless came in and I do believe that people have completely stopped showing up at board meetings complaining about a lack of transparency or um, 
funky intentions, if you will. And so, Ms. Weathers, I want to thank you for working with this board and for, it seems to me, bending over backwards to really please all of the many, many, many different people making demands on your time and energy. I think that you've done an absolutely phenomenal job, and I just thank you um, for, for TUSD and, and for the, the district and the community. Thank you for the report. That was also great. And But seriously, with the, the budget study sessions and all of the different requests that we've made, that I have made, uh, and that you know that other board members have made, and you've just always come through and always done it with an attitude that I wish that I could uh, maintain myself sometimes. So again, sincerely, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you like to move the item also, Ms. Sudwick Gordon? Yes, I would like to move the item. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and second that. So the item was moved by Ms. Sudwick Gordon and seconded by Ms. Foster, Mr. Burke. I'm ready to vote. All right, any other questions or comments? Ms. Counts? No, nope, just ready to vote. And Ms. Kutbihalba? I see you guys turn off your turn on your mics, so I think you have comments or questions. And so um, all those in favor say aye. 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 And anybody opposed? OK, thank you, Ms. Weatherless, for your work. I know it's, these are numbers in the opposite direction that we've seen for a long, long time. And um, thank you for this work. All right, and I would just like to say thank you all for your service, Ms. Foster, Ms. Cedric Gordon, and, and Mr. Burke, thank you. Thank you, have a safe and lovely holiday. Thank I think you. I forgot to say no opposed and that this item passes. Okay, and I better vote online, Ms. Foster. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Trujillo, item 8.1. Now we have study slash action items. Yes, uh, item 8.1, President Foster board members, we have a recommendation from the audit committee uh, to establish a financial dashboard that would be ex fully accessible uh, to members of the public. And here tonight to speak to this recommendation, we're gonna welcome Renee back uh, from the previous item, as well as Mr. Darren Guthrie, who is our audit committee chairperson uh, to talk to the board about its recommendation. Thank you. Who would like to start? Mr. Guthrie, go right ahead. Well, <laughs> welcome to our meeting this evening. Hope you, there we go. I can't hear you. Can anybody else hear Mr. Guthrie? No. No. No boot. We still can't hear you. You don't have your mute on, but something's happening for us not to be able to hear you. Let me turn it over to Ms. Weatherless while you work on that. Maybe sign in and come back. I know. Okay. Well, hopefully he can come back and his audio is, is in. Um, so I hate to steal a thunder. Um, <laughs> the audit committee was was tasked with um, making some recommendations regarding financial transparency and and some other items that were um, proposed from from the governing board. And they have spent um, time throughout the year. It looks like he's connecting. We've we've met and we had a lot of conversation, discussion, and and feedback going back and forth on what that means and and what we should be pro proposing for the district. So in the end, we ended up um, the committee itself came with proposals and worked with me and we put together um, some templates, and those have been reviewed and I believe that. Uh, he would like to speak to that. Some of those reports that are gonna be included in this, this uh, recommendation, I've actually went ahead and started putting into the expenditure update. So last month, there were two new reports, budget to actual and budget to actual by funding source. Those came straight out of the audit committee. So those were able to be incorporated and I've already put them in and will continue doing so on a monthly basis. Um, I see he's still connecting. So let's ask Mr. Armstrong if there's anything. Oh, maybe now? Nope, oh, maybe. Cross your fingers, everybody. We just have to unmute you. Am I, am I, there you am, go. Is, it, is it working? 
Yes, we got you. Okay, well, that's Mac a miracle. MacGyver, MacGuthrie, that's what we're going to call you. <laughs> Figure it out. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed, uh, I missed the beginning of what uh, Ms. Wetherless said. So um, I'm coming in with, you know, a little cold here. That's all right. Um, so wh 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 where, where were you when I showed up? <laughs> Um, you can go ahead and start from the beginning. Just give them the short end of the uh, the task that was assigned to the audit committee and, and the recommendations that were made. And I also commented that one of the, the reports, the budget to actual, that I've already incorporated that into my monthly report. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, this uh, began, this journey, I'm going to call it, uh, in uh, spring of 2019, um, during a, a a transition in the audit committee where i was taking uh, uh very soon after that uh, charge was issued i took uh, over as chair of that committee and uh you know i i'm just going to be honest and say that i was daunted by the scope of the charge uh when it was first laid out in front of us um because uh it's it's not a little thing that is being described or asked uh, nevertheless, uh, I charged ahead, and uh, with uh, the assistance of Ms. Weatherless and uh, the rest of the committee, we did seek to try to undertake, you know, the, the, the task of responding to the charge. And we saw a number of uh, demonstrations of different, uh, you know, software packages from different vendors. And there was a lot of discussion, um, ultimately, uh, there was a, just a lot to talk about. And so, you know, there was so much to that we could have put into this recommendation that we kind of got overwhelmed. And, and so I made the, uh, uh, you know, uh, decision to try to distill it down to what, what could we all agree on and let's uh, make that recommendation as a starting point for what would hopefully be a continuing process of discussion and uh, development for what would ultimately be, you know, uh, over over a period of time, you know, uh, an extremely useful tool for the board uh, for study, for research, and for, you know, sort of demystifying some of the uh, uh, aspects of finance that um, even those of us on the audit committee who are CPAs and have years of experience still uh, find ourselves, you know, trying to uh, master these concepts. And I really have to, you know, acknowledge the, uh, the real uh, amazing work that is done by board members uh, coming in from the public. Uh, you don't get a degree in uh, nonprofit finance as a prerequisite, and yet here you are. And so I just want to uh, say that what we developed as this uh, recommendation was really intended to be a starting point. And what we hope will come out of it is a continuing discussion of ways that we can uh, further assist uh, the, the governing board and I, identifying the right kinds of tools to help you guys answer the questions you need uh, the information to answer. And so uh, what we arrived at was um, as uh, Ms. Weatherless alluded to, some report types that she has already incorporated into her existing uh, uh, regular finance report. The idea of the dashboard is more, uh, more or less an idea of a place where you can um, centralize these reports and this information uh, so that uh, you have kind of a one-stop shop for uh, your, your research into finance. Um, in addition to the types of reports that uh, Ms. Weatherless put together as attachments here, we also wanted to recommend that uh, there be some linking done to uh, certain uh, Arizona Department of Education website resources regarding, uh, you know, student counts um, and, uh, you know, site counts. Uh, and also provide five years of historical expenditure data so that uh, we can, you know, begin to see the trends and uh, accomplish some useful analysis on that point. Um, now, again, you know, I'm just going to acknowledge that 
these uh, initial recommendations are intended to be preliminary, and we hope that uh, this conversation can be ongoing about ways to improve upon this model. Uh, and, and possibly it might even make sense to establish a subcommittee or another, um, you know, kind of a work group that really focuses on just this problem. Uh, on the audit committee, there's a, you know, a, 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 it's, it's far less in scope than what you guys deal with, but uh, we do have a number of different issues that cross our uh, 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 radar. And so, you know, focusing on one thing to the exclusion of everything else, unfortunately, is a luxury we don't have. So um, I do hope that we can continue this project in, uh, in a collaborative way with the governing board to uh, meet your goals. And with that, I'm going to take a break. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. So this is a study action item and uh, we can approve if there's a motion to to accept the the project right to have a data data dashboard or a financial data dashboard i could say as recommended by the audit committee all right board members miss grijalva i would move the item i think that's a great idea i'd like to second all right item was moved by miss grijalva and seconded by mr K by mr by miss counts Dr. Trujillo, did you have any comments before we open it up to other questions or comments? I want to thank the audit committee. I want to thank Mr. Guthrie. It really is a labor of love. Um, they dedicate their best efforts and their time and service to the district. And like Mr. Guthrie said, it's no small task. Um, you have widely acclaimed professional CPAs coming in. Trying to understand Arizona school finance is like a different language. And so our job is to try to make an already complex subject and topic accessible to the public. And that's something that I hope that these reports are gonna be able to do. <clears throat> Thank you. Other questions or comments, board members? I wanna extend that. Thank you as well, Mr. Guthrie, and for your time on the audit committee and to all of the other committee members. Thank you. All right, I don't see- Thank you very much. I don't see any opposition, so I'm going to just go ahead and ask for all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes five to zero. Thank you, Ms. Weatherless and Mr. Guthrie, and have a safe and uh, calm holiday season, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 8.2, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, item uh, 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4 are all really connected. So I'll be turning it over to Mr. Ross uh, for the next uh, three items. But item uh, 8.2, of course, is at the heart of the other two items. And so tonight uh, we're going to be reviewing a policy that would provide more guidance uh, in terms of clear guidance concerning the non-discrimination of students based on gender identity, specifically with regard to instances in which they are requesting uh, changes uh, to student records or even informal student records, such as a name on Zoom and what that process would entail. So with that, uh, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Ross. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, uh, and good evening, board members. Uh, as Dr. Trujillo said, this is a, uh, uh, a, a new policy, and, and uh, it's a, so it's a first read, and um, you know this is something that uh, I guess we should, probably should have had all along. We already have a strong policy that prohibits discrimination and harassment of students based on gender expression, uh, but this uh, really gives some some more uh, uh, put some meat on the bones for it. Uh, and that we, you know, we have to thank, uh, I think, some of our, our very passionate counselors advocating for students uh, who brought, you know, brought this to our attention that we don't have a strong policy. Um, so this draft is taken from uh, a model policy that was created by the National Center for Transgender Equality a couple of years ago. And um, as, you, as you look through this, you'll see that it, it does reaffirm the district's non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies, um, which uh, is mainly contained in AC and also in our some of our bullying policies as well. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were honoring a student's gender expression um, 
in all areas of the district's operation. And so we've got some definitions in there that were provided by the uh, Center for uh, National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, we also want to, as Dr. Trujillo said, and I think um, the Zoom experience really brought the a focus on this. We want to be able to uh, provide students with their choice of uh, of how they're identified on um, on uh, online platforms in a way that affirms their gender expression. Um, this is not to say that you know someone can can just uh, decide that they're going to call themselves, as Dr. Trio sometimes has said, Mr. Sparky. We're talking about students who have um, a, a a a strong feeling of who they are and want that to be shown in the records um, and to be treated that way in school, not just by uh, their classmates, but by teachers as well um, and everyone in the school environment. Um, the, the, the Zoom experience is kind of a unique one for us because uh, we have tied our records, um, our student record system to our Zoom security. So if you're uh, coming online to a Zoom classroom, uh, and we're, we need to protect you know our classrooms from uh, from bad actors who might want to come in and do Zoom bombing or 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 mine for information about our students. All that security is tied up into our Synergy system. So we want we needed to navigate how we can do that and still uh, make sure that we're honoring our students' uh, dis decisions here. So what we have proposed is that um, a student can make a request to change uh, their uh, gender information, their name information, um, and we will, we will affect that. Um, and if it's, a, if it's a change, it's going to affect the student's uh, uh, education record as that's defined in FERPA, but then um, the parent would be informed of that and will let the students know that. So that's, um, that's the kind of the overview of what this policy does. Uh, I think it's a, a good step to um, affirming and putting a little more detail into how we will um, we will protect our students uh, based on their gender expression. All right, Mr. Ross, thank you. I do have a quick question before I ask other board members if they have questions. This this is a first read, which means then it's a six week process, correct, to go out for review and then we have a come back as a second read are we able to fast forward that and make sure that this if the board were to want to put this into practice starting tomorrow that we um, i'm just worried that we still have two weeks of zoom meetings and i would like to and we've already gone too long with this um is that possible this evening to to vote to put this into policy right now or do we have to go through the whole first read, second read process? So, President Foster, uh, ordinarily your your policy adoption process um, has a four week, not six week, a four week um, gap. Although in this, you know, with the holiday, it probably would end up being closer to six uh, period between a a first read and while it's up for public uh, discussion. But your policy also provides for the board to uh, to uh, skip that process and adopt something immediately if it wants to. So you have that off ramp, if you will, um, if the board wants to make something effective sooner. And I know in the past, the board has done that and still put it out for public comment um, and, and see uh, if there's anything after the review period that the board might want to adjust. So uh, that's been kind of a, a middle ground that the board has sometimes taken when when it wants to have something effective uh, quick, more quickly than waiting for the four weeks. Okay, all right, board members. It's hard for me to, I have to flip through and see people with the uh, screen share. Ms. Grijalva. I would be in favor of voting on the item and then putting it out for the public if that's something that other board members are interested in. Voting to bypass the second read and start tomorrow with this? Yes. Okay. So are you moving the item? I just wanted to see if there was an interest on other board members. And if there is, then yes, I would happily move the item. I would be happy to second that if that's a motion. 
Okay, I'll then I'll, I'll, support that. I'll support that view. Okay. I support that as well, also. There you go. So it sounds like- It's a motion and a second by Mr. Council. <laughs> So the, the item as presented was moved by Ms. Grijalva and seconded by Ms. Counts. I felt the urgency in that from all of us to resolve this scenario. Uh, Mr. Ross, does that mean tomorrow this changes? Or I mean, it's kind of been a technology, people tell me we can't because of the technology. When can this go into practice if it's passed this evening? Uh, it can go into effect tomorrow. Uh, I think it's, it's a combination of technology and, um, and uh, I, I guess I would say uh, uh, process, like we've always done it this way kind of thing. And I think that part can change uh, very quickly. We could even send an email out after the vote to make sure people know. Uh, I will be happy to do that. Okay, Dr. Trujillo, you turned off on your video and your mic. Did you have a comment or a question? Uh, I want to thank Mr. Ross and I want to thank our team that really came together and uh, really listened to the employees and the students that were advocating. And uh, this has not been an easy situation because you're also you're trying to navigate um, statute and our adherence to parents' rights with regards to um, student record requests and changes. You're trying to navigate our own district policy. So there was a lot of moving parts and I'm just really proud of how everybody came together to try to find uh, what I think is a, is a very, very uh, worthwhile solution here. All right, it's a first step forward for sure. And I don't hear any opposition to this or any concern. And so I will, we have a motion and a second. And so I will ask all those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? And from my understand that goes into action right now. Okay, thank you. Next item, item 8.3, Dr. Mr. Ross, Dr. Mr. Ross. Uh, I think we're on 8.2, is that right? Thank you, no, 8.3 was the, 8.2 was the gender identity. So we're on 8.3, is that right? Did I say that wrong? 8.3, correct. Okay, my notes are wrong. Let's see, 8.3 is AC, that's right. Yes. Okay, uh, this is a, a fairly uh, minor suggested change to our anti-discrimination policy. And it would um, include as a possible uh, available uh, consequence for violation of our anti-discrimination policy uh, that uh, that the district could uh, could have uh, if it's a student or an employee uh, have required attendance at, at training programs as uh, one of the co possible consequences and that would apply uh, to uh, either an employee or a student obviously if it's a a member of the public, then we wouldn't have any ability to do that. Um, we would follow our uh, policy, KFA, public conduct on school property for um, anyone who is outside of the district who's violating our anti-discrimination policy. So that's uh, that's the minor addition to AC that we're proposing here. All right, board members. Mr. I'll move the item for approval. I'll second. All right, Mr. Burke moved the item and Ms. Sedwick Gordon um, seconded. I wanted to say that I think this is really in line with our restorative justice work that we, you know, it's about learning and not about, um, about punishment. It's about opportunity to be better. And so I thank you for that, for bringing this forward. Any other questions or comments, board members? All right, and I don't see any opposition, so I will um, move by Mr. Burke and seconded by Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Anybody opposed? Item passes five to zero. Okay, item 8.4, Mr. Ross. Okay, let me get that one up here. Okay, 8.4 8 is um, 
our policy on teaching about controversial and sensitive issues. It hasn't been um, revised in about 13 years. And uh, we took a look at the ASBA model and saw that uh, they have a little bit more detail in terms of guidance for um, for teachers. And you'll see that in the big paragraph versus the existing language, which is uh, just a couple of words. We uh, you know, taking a look at the the ASBA model found that it's, it seems to be to be much more explanatory uh, for teachers. Um, and let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to mention about this one. Um, we've done some cross-referencing to our uh, current policy AC, the definitions, um, so that uh, there's a direct uh, direct uh, reference there that we would include um, any uh, discriminatory language to be potentially a controversial or um, sensitive issue and want to make sure that uh, that teachers are supported um, with their administration if they're going to embark on that um, in a classroom. So that's the the gist of what's happening there. Okay, I, I'd like to start the conversation before we turn this. Um, is that I can't support this item. I shared this with Dr. Trujillo, and I shared it with Mr. Ross. And I absolutely like the the intent of this item. Yes, yes, the intent is there, but I don't think this is the right language to do that. And I just want to read that email. So my other board members hear my point, my, my concern about this. And this, what I said, said is that my concern is with the last paragraph in this revision. Um, it, I think this will stifle instruction and encourage teachers to skip important lessons from history and current events. I think this policy discourages these critical lessons rather than encouraging teachers to include some of the most meaningful and relevant lessons their students can engage in. Um, so I don't know why include these lessons if you have to then have them improved by a principal and possibly create an alternative lesson. So I, I think if as a teacher, I would rather skip them. I would just skip those lessons altogether. And I don't want us to encourage teachers to skip these critical lessons. Uh, the paragraph, if you can is it possible to zoom in? It's the paragraph that says teachers intending to include any of the um, above as part of career. So, so we have a definition of foul language, if you will. And but the way that we have defined it, <clears throat> the paragraph state stated above means that anyone teaching any piece of literature, historical event, or an artifact or source or references to a current event that discusses race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, national origin or disability must get pre-approved from their principal or possibly craft another lesson to go with it. Yes, you can teach about these without slurs and jokes. Of course, you can teach about religion or race without slurs and jokes, but I don't know how you teach any of these topics without incorporating Epithets, epithets, negative stereotyping, or threatening, derogatory, or intimidating ideas. Talking about how LGBTQ undocumented immigrants or Jewish individuals have been, uh, how they have been treated historically or even today, must include negative stereotypes or threatening or derogatory, intimidating ideas. Um, or you're not teaching what really happened or in some cases, what continues to happen. So I think it's important work. Um, I just don't, I don't get to see this to the finish line with you guys, um, but I just hope you consider my perspective and my suggestions and continue working on this because I ultimately want to, I, I appreciate that we need to stop slurs in the classroom, specifically the, the N word absolutely and people teaching around that um, and doing so with with um, maybe all the right intentions but triggering a lot of students we, we have to do that differently um, but I, I don't want us to I want us to empower our teachers and our students um, with a 
the policy rather than stop them in their tracks. And so I, I'm the first person to stand up for civil rights, um, but I don't want to, I don't want to um, stop teachers from this important work. And I think this policy can, will, could do that, unfortunately. So I don't want us to stop. I just don't think this is the right language for this evening. Uh, Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, I want to thank President Foster. We were able to have a really great conversation. Um, and she's very passionate. And she's, you know, I, I view our conversation as our governing board president standing up for academic freedom. Um, I'm going to present another viewpoint in terms of why I support this item. I don't view this item as restrictive in the sense that a teacher can't teach these sensitive areas. I think we're doing two key things here. Um, I think number one, we're making sure that parents are informed, that their kids are gonna be exposed to some sensitive topics. And I think a parent has a right to be informed. And also uh, just speaking as a former principal, the principal is on the hook. The principal is ultimately accountable uh, for behavior or any conduct that is engaged in uh, in the classroom and that parents may have a problem with. And I think we give principal the key, we give principals the keys. We give them the radios. We give them the responsibility. I think that we uh, need to support them and at least make them aware and give them the authority to be able to become aware of the sensitive subjects and topics that may be taught. Give them an opportunity as the chief academic officer of their respective buildings to make sure that it is a part of the curriculum and that also that we are again taking that all important step of informing parents. I wouldn't encourage any principal to deny or restrict or um, try to discourage a teacher from engaging in what I agree with Ms. Foster are very, very painful, but very important lessons and concepts that are part of our nation's history. And I think they're important and I do believe that they belong in the classroom. But I think also we, we have parents and their partners and we need to make them aware also, I view this as a protective measure for teachers. Uh, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, we've seen some very, very uh, sad situations where we have seen teachers uh, embark on this course, but they have not checked in with the principal or have they, not ta they have not taken steps to notify parents. And it unfortunately resulted in some bad situations. Uh, if the principal is aware, if the school administration is aware, they're better able to support and protect the teacher if a parent wants to lodge an accusation after the fact, um, you, this this may not be the way. You know, hearing uh, Miss Foster speak, but I would ultimately not recommend a policy that doesn't, at the very least, have a parental notification component and doesn't have some sort of an informational advisory component for building principles. If we're going to embark on these types of lessons, which I do agree are important uh, in terms of of educating students about the painful lessons of our past history as a nation. So just my thoughts in terms of um, an administrative recommendation. And my last comment, and then I'll definitely turn it over. I won't over if I won't take over the conversation, but we have a history. We have a history in this district of <clears throat> um, censoring teachers and curriculum, and this scares me for that. And we have a whole department that teaches teachers, right, our culturally relevant department. Um, and I asked if they, anybody in that department or anybody in our, I, I had saw this at all and they had not seen this. And so I am really, really encourage the board. This is a study item. I think it's a healthy beginning, but I really hope that we, that the, the next board will continue to study this um, and not pass this this evening. Ms. Foster? Yes, Ms. Counts. Um, I'd have to agree with you because I feel like this is a slippery slope sort of um, situation we're in where you could take anything um, and you start picking it apart. You start really diving in deep with the teaching around uh, tough subjects. And um, it's it just has the potential to really turn into to censorship as I see it and as you expressed really well. So I 
will support this as a study item, but I do think it needs to um, have different stakeholders. I would like to see the culturally relevant curriculum um, folks and our uh, teachers and, and just more voices put into any kind of policy that has the potential to um, <coughs> be a game changer for for our students and for our teachers and what they can and cannot discuss in the classroom. So um, I just think it's it's a little bit too open for uh, interpretation and um, could potentially stifle our teachers. Right, other board members? Ms. Grijalva. Yeah, I, I think that it would be really helpful to get input from um, teachers and principals, because I think that that may be some of the language changes that um, Ms. Foster is so concerned about. Would um, there would be some alternative? Sorry, because the concern that I have is that if we have a policy like this, that it would just discourage teachers from having to from going through the process, and we don't really want to do that. And so, I I want to make sure that we. Um, that it's something that really safeguards our students, but in a way that encourages the kind of dialogue that is, I think, really beneficial and helpful for critical thinkers, um, especially in our high schools. So um, I do think that it would be important for us to get some feedback, especially from teachers that teach, um, you know, that kind of, that teach really, um, our advanced classes, some of our classes that are really just um, any of our culturally relevant courses. Um, I think all of those, any kind of feedback in that regard would be really helpful. One of the things that we could do is maybe have that go through, have this go through um, a couple other teachers, get some feedback and then maybe bring it back in the second meeting in January and let us have a conversation. I do think it would be helpful. I'll go through and highlight um, the concerns that I think Crystal really, uh, the concerns that I had are the same ones that Crystal brought up. So um, trying to trying to skate that I think would be um, something that is worthwhile. Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Uh, I actually disagree to a degree. I think that this policy actually serves to protect teachers and TUSD by putting out notice. Uh, I think that it's pretty specific that epithets, slurs, jokes, negative stereotyping, et cetera, that relate to race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it seems to me my understanding of the policy is that if teachers are going to be teaching, they're going to be including derogatory comments, you know, these epithets, slurs, jokes, et cetera, et cetera, in their lesson, that they should know that they really need to consider this very carefully before they bring it to their students. And if they have any doubt about what they're going to be teaching and whether or not it might be a little offensive to somebody in the classroom, they should bring it to the principal. I think that this kind of policy seems to be the perfect thing that we could send out for the four week consideration by the public. And I also would highly recommend that um, if it's possible, we could email this policy as a draft to the teachers and to the schools to get their feedback on it, to hear what the teachers have to say about it. If they think that it is um, very restrictive or that it really just provides some guidance for them. Thank you. But I should say, um, with my comments, I'll move the item to see if it gets a second. Well, uh, I'll second the item, and, and here's the reason. I, I do think that there are some issues that are problematic here, um, but I tend to fall into uh, the camp with Ms. Sedgwick that the Issues that are required to be brought to the principal under this policy are fairly narrow. And ultimately, I think it's important that families, parents in specific, get noticed so that the opportunity to make a decision on whether their student should 
hear, hear the lesson or opt out of it is an important uh, decision that parents need to be aware of. So the problems come when we use the word who uh, the principal shall confirm that the lesson is age appropriate and adequate, adequately connected to the curriculum. Um, I mean, that could, I don't know. Uh, but I think this is important to get out. And um, although I understand the reservations, um, I'm not persuaded. So I don't think it's a, a harmful decision to simply send it out for, for comment by a motion to approve it for that purpose. The reason that I was hoping that, the, that this item would not come for a vote is because I don't think any of us want to vote against the notion of this. I don't want to vote against the notion of this, but this is not the way this is. This, me, me reading this as a teacher, I read this and I say, I if I'm going to talk about anything that, um, if I'm going to talk about the, the Holocaust and I'm going to talk about threaten, because it says, negative stereotyping or threats. I don't, I think this is opening up to, to censorship and teach and principals will have to approve so many things because it can be interpreted so many, so, so concretely, because you can look at this and you can say that the, that the Holocaust cannot be taught unless you have principal approval. Um, you can look at this and say that current events can't be taught. Black Lives Matter can't be talked about unless the principal gives your approval. And, and if the principal approves it the way this, or if the principal doesn't approve it, or you have to have an alternative lesson. And so you have to have two different lessons. This just makes so much more work for a teacher that I'm just going to say, I'm not going to go there. I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to take the risk of, um, of breaking this policy, which means you are stopping teachers from having the most the most important critical lessons the way that this is written. I asked Mr. Ross to look, I, I appreciate the work that went into this and I asked him to bring, um, I know this is ASBA policy, but I know other states have language. I asked for different language. I just really don't want us to, I don't want to vote no because it looks like I'm voting no against that I want to, and there's no way I want teachers to be using um, jokes and slurs in, their, in our classroom at all. But I just, I, when I read this policy, I see censoring teachers and stopping them from the important work. And that's why I really tried to encourage you all not to bring this forward to a vote because none of us want to go on record uh, saying that I wouldn't vote for a policy to to stop you know, the, the use of the N-word in our classrooms. But I hope people will look at the whole entire conversation here that we're having um, and not just the, the number of the vote. And so I'm really disappointed that we, um, yeah. that we have to vote on this now. Uh, uh, Ms. Foster, based on your comments. I'm sorry, can, can, you, can, can you guys raise your hand? Because three people started to talk at once. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and just speak because I think my comments might eradicate the need for others. Um, I'm going to go ahead and withdraw my motion because I hear what you're saying, Ms. Foster, and I don't think that we need to force the vote. Uh, Mr. Ross, this is an item that if it doesn't go for a vote right now, it's possible to be tweaked. The board can look at the language and make sure that it, right, it's going to come back. This policy will come back to the board. Mr. Ross? Uh, well, if it's if it's not approved for a first read, then uh, it would be up to uh, the administration or board member to bring it back. Uh, first read can come back with changes um, at a at a later date. Um, so, but it's a study action item, so we can just study and start the conversation tonight. That's true. You don't have to vote at all. And then leave it as an action item for a, a later. Hmm? agenda <clears throat> okay so then in that case i'm going to go ahead and stick with my I'll, I'll withdraw my motion to vote and just um leave this as a study action item for the next agenda thank you well i will uh 
I will defer to Ms. Sedgwick Gordon's decision and uh, withdraw my second. I, I'm not sure that this is all that definitive uh, in, in getting this out into the public. I think that's the important part. Um, so I suppose we can just study it and kick it over to the next board. That sounds like we're, what we're going to do. But to me, uh, passing this at this time would not have made it a policy. It would have made it an opportunity for comment. And I think we did start that conversation this evening. And I thank Ms. Sedwick Gordon for withdrawing her motion and Mr. Burke as well. Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Uh, my last two comments. I did want to point out also, Ms. Foster, I think that this, um, that, that the, the language there that refers to epithets and slurs, negative stereotyping, threatening, derogatory, intimidating, or hostile acts, that's already governing board policy, right? Uh, and that's, that's already in the policy. And this policy just seems to refer to those other policies that say, hey, teachers, don't forget that this exists. These, these things that are listed here are a problem. They're considered discriminatory. But as a learning institution, if you're going to use these words that are also potentially educational, you need to make sure that you do it in a very, very sensible way. Um, maybe I shouldn't have withdrawn the motion, but hey, hey, you know, we'll go for a consensus. My very, very last comment is actually not related to this particular policy, but I did want to thank Mr. Ross, because once again, when I first got onto the board, um, as far as I'm concerned, in my personal opinion, the TUSD policies were a mess and everything was everywhere and they really needed um, serious reconsideration. They needed to be organized and, and really reconsidered. And you have without fail been bringing forward these policies. I was going to make it a personal mission when I first got on the board, not realizing <laughs> just how difficult and how time consuming it would be. And I, I again, truly thank you for the phenomenal job that you have done and the whole legal department, I think, um, has really helped the district to stand up in the eyes of the entire Tucson community. And that has a great deal to do with you and your work and, and the legal team. So I thank you for bringing forward this policy and all of the other policies that board members uh, may or may not have, um, have noticed needed attention. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Cedric, that, that, I greatly appreciate that, uh, but I will uh, say that there's no policy work that a legal department can do without the support of board members who are interested in doing policy work, which isn't always the most fun thing for you to do, but um, I have found uh, you and the rest of the board members have been um, probably more willing than um, any other board I've worked with um, for a long time that, that was... Uh, that really focused on when policies came up, you took them seriously. So I appreciate that. And, and again, thank you, Ms. Cedric. It's been great working with you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Trujillo. I'm, I'm confident we can get to a middle ground uh, because, this, uh, number one, this is a study item. There, the board is not compelled to take any action tonight. Um, I'm confident, you know, kind of hearing everybody's feedback uh, that I think we can get to that balance of um making sure that teachers aren't subjected to censorship while still honoring the principal's right to know and to be able to support uh, what's going on in classrooms on their respective campus and a parent's right to be informed if there's going to be discussion of sensitive topics i think we can get there uh, this isn't anything that's urgent that needs to be um, voted on tonight we ideally on a policy like this we certainly would like a 5.0. So we certainly don't want to force a vote tonight and would be happy to take it back, see if we can do some wordsmithing, bring it back to the new board, try to get it out there for that policy development review process. Thank you. <coughs> All right, item in 9.1, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, item 9.1. Let's get back to our agenda. And I believe, <clears throat> if I can get back, we have the State of the District's Network. Uh, our Chief Technology Officer, Mr. Blaine Young, talking about some really impressive district enhancements uh, for uh, our schools that we've been able to complete during this time of remote instruction. Mr. Young, 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Trujillo, and uh, good evening, board president, members of the board. Actually, uh, Robbie Hamadi, our director of IT, is going to walk us through this overview, and I will join Robbie for any questions at the end. So, Robbie, uh, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Uh, president Foster, members of the board, I'm Rabia Hamadi. I will give you a, a quick overview of our uh, network uh, at the district and uh, emphasis on quick because it is a large network and it serves a lot of uh, students and uh, teachers. Um, and uh, each item could take a PowerPoint presentation by itself. But uh, I'll do my best and I'll answer any questions uh, that you have. Uh, and uh, also Mr. Young will answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, next uh, slide. So the agenda today is a quick overview and the key components of uh, our network or of any network and our network in uh, at Tucson Unified School District. Uh, some recent uh, network upgrades that we made our network uh, a little bit better and faster. Uh, some of the network challenges that, uh, that uh, we had uh, this year and past years, and some future network upgrades in the next uh, few months and few years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> our network consists of uh, what we call a backbone that is 10 gigabits per second fast. Um, and um, it has three main uh, points, three main hubs, uh, a co-location external to TUSD in Tucson, uh, the Mora Data Center at 1010, and the uh, main hub also at Palo Verde High School on the east side. Uh, all the schools are connected via one gigabits uh, per second network and uh, 10 gigabits for, uh, for the internet uh, as well. Um, the infrastructure is mainly to provide uh, security for our students and staff, uh, availability at 100%, and also speed uh, to make sure that our instructions and all operations are done in, in a fast manner. Uh, some of the network components, which I will not go over uh, in detail, but um, uh, you, we have data and voice network. We have uh, firewalls for security, routers and switches, wireless, uh, load balancing, uh, servers, physical and virtual uh, application and end user devices, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. This is a graphical uh, overview of our network. As you see on um, uh, the right side is Palo Verde, on the left side is Morrow. Uh, below is our co-location data center. So those are our three main hubs connected by 10 gigabits per second. And you see our schools and sites in the middle connected to that backbone and to each other via uh, one gigabits per second uh, line. And for some of us who are not always familiar with what the gigabit and megabit is, one gigabit per second is one billion bits per second. So uh, uh, that's <laughs> that sounds pretty fast, but when you have 50,000 users using the network, that sometimes can have its challenges uh, as well. Next slide. Some of the recent network upgrades, uh, I put 2014 in here, which uh, 2014 in technology age uh, six years ago seems like ancient history. But this date is pretty important because that date in 2014, we switched our network from a copper network to a fiber optic network. A copper network uh, speed is one megabits per second, that is one million bits per second, to a 1 billion bits per second or 10 billion bits per second. So that was a major year that improved our network to make it, to make it possible for us to do what we do today and, and all the years since, uh, since uh, 2014. Uh, also, a co-location was also uh, created in 2014 that is always being upgraded. Uh, some major changes to our wireless network in 2017 to 2019 was done at all the schools and sites uh, by replacing the controllers and what we call APs or access points. Uh, the internet upgrade uh, has been upgraded in 2019 from two to 10 gigabits per second, all the way now to 50 gigabits per second, and that will take about five years uh, to complete. Uh, other small and medium specific network upgrades uh, have been done, such as uh, uh, upgrading uh, the, the devices, the controllers, the uh, routers, the firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. And as you know, uh, USAC usually through our ERA program pays for about 80% of our upgrades and we pay at TSD about 20%. Next slide, please. Some of our network challenges, recently we had to upgrade our content filtering, uh, that is for the SIPA laws, 
uh, Children Internet Protection Act. Uh, and sometimes when you change uh, uh, something major like this, you may create new traffic or more traffic. Uh, so that uh, added to our uh, challenges a little bit. Uh, add to that the fact that we have a lot of students at home and staff at home that changed the network in a way. Uh, it, it added more challenges to make sure that, uh, for example, when we're having uh, 10,000 students or more using Zoom at the same time, or using Clever at the same time, or using Office 365 at the same time, that puts a lot of heavy uh, duty uh, traffic on our network, and we had to deal with that. Um, Another thing that uh, our teams do is using something called MDM or mobile device management. Um, the names are Intune for Microsoft, G Suite for Google products, and Mosul for Apple product. And what that means is we have to be able to make changes or upload applications or download applications to about 10,000 devices at one time remotely without touching the device. And that's challenging and to be done in a fast manner and in an efficient manner uh, needs some heavy engineering and a lot of good teamwork uh, uh, to be done. So those are some of the challenges, not only created by the, by the pandemic uh, that we had, but also for any network. The pandemic added to the challenges, of course, because now we have a network on site and a network at home that we have to support uh, remotely. Next slide, please. Some of our future network upgrades, and that's not all of them, but some of the main one. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the SIPA laws have to be always uh, uh, be secure. So our content filtering upgrades will keep going until we have a 100% satisfaction on our network. Uh, the wireless controllers will always have to be upgraded. As you know, in technology, every year is, uh, is a long year. So uh, 2021, 2022, and after, uh, the wireless controllers will have to be upgraded to make sure that we have a fast uh, connection at all times. Um, also, like uh, as I mentioned, our internet and backbone upgrades are going from 10 gigabits per second up to 20 gigabits per second. So it doubles, and that is pretty fast. Uh, but again, if you have 50,000 50, users uh, using the network at the same time, or at least half of them, that's challenging by itself. Um, we always have little and medium uh, uh, improvement to our network uh, anyway on a yearly basis uh, to make sure that uh, that our network is up to par. Uh, the MDM upgrades, as I mentioned, mobile device management in, in today's age of cloud computing and remote learning, MDM becomes a major part of our network. You have to do everything remotely and you have to do it for a large number of customers or a large number of our students and staff. And of course, we're always expanding on our wireless network uh, by working with companies such as uh, T-Mobile or Verizon or Cox, and also working with the city of Tucson, and they're providing uh, great help uh, and also other partners to make sure that our wireless uh, capabilities for all our students uh, throughout Tucson and throughout the uh, map of uh, Tucson Unified School District is available at all times for all our students and staff. Next slide. So anyway, that's a quick overview. And uh, again, uh, I, re I need to emphasize quick because it's a, it's a large network, but uh, that gives you at least an idea of what we can do using our network to provide support for students at home and students on our physical buildings and as well as teachers uh, and staff. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions and so will Blaine. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Ms. Grijalva. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you are um, talking about this and the issues because that was one of the things that um, when we were talking about hybrid, some of the teachers and staff were very concerned because uh, some of the schools were already having connectivity issues with just a really small number of staff and students on campus. And so I think that that capacity and ensuring that that is something that we can do is really important and so i'm glad that it's um you're factoring into all of it and and understanding that you know um with that many staff and students and teachers online and the kinds of demands that zoom has i mean we're having the same connectivity issues in my house with when we're all on zoom i have to turn my camera off or the kids they we're all thinking at the same time and so um with all those devices when we have student devices phones, all of that that are tapping into all of it, 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 it does, it will overload any system. So I appreciate um, the update. Sure. 
other questions or comments from board members? Ms. Sebek Gordon. I'm gonna take the opportunity to thank you for the information, but I have to praise our tech department. I feel like this is gonna be my, my thing this evening, but to really thank you guys. I, I think the, the leadership is tremendous. The techs are tremendous. The, the tech department has been doing such a phenomenal job um, for this year, the last year. Um, you know, I mean, it's just really, really been amazing. And everything that you all have accomplished in the past few years with all of the, um, you know, um, rolling out all of the different new uh, programs that are, you know, directly involved with the technology and the grants. And um, I just, I think that the department is truly fantastic. And uh, Mr. Young, it has a lot to do with your leadership, of course, and Mr. Hamaday. The, the two of you, I think, make an excellent pair. I'm sorry I stopped coming to the uh, technology meetings. My excuse is, you know, leaving the country. It's not a good excuse. I, I should have continued coming, and I'm sorry I, I didn't have the chance, but uh, I learned a lot at those meetings, and I truly, truly, sincerely appreciate you, and I wonder if the district understands that it couldn't run without you. I mean, every, every department is essential, but technology, especially now, is just um, definitely first and foremost. So thank you for your hard work and, and your success. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And I absolutely agree. I can't even tell, I don't know if you were here, Mr. Young, when the photo, the, I mean, when I started as a board member, Dr. Patticone said, please spend some time with the different departments and walking into that technology department. And I know there were photos of where it, it was just, so the transformation over the last eight years that has happened in, in technology and that I'm, I'm just very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, other questions or comments, board members? Please have a safe, safe um, holiday season. And thank you both. Yep. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Dr. Trujillo, item 9.2. You're on mute, sir. There we go. Sorry about that. Even after all this time on Zoom, still muted. All right, uh, President Foster, board members, uh, tonight we want to uh, inform the public and the board of our plan, our implementation plan for the recently approved family life curriculum, which will include a timeline for teacher, teacher professional development and training as well as information on our soon to be newly established district wide window uh, for the teaching of the uh, roughly 10 lesson component. So I'd like to bring our team that uh, was putting this together. I'd like to bring them forward and our lead presenter. Um, this evening is Amanda Confair. She's new to us uh, in her role as professional development academic trainer, but she's done an excellent job uh, putting together our timeline for implementation. I will turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Dr. Trujillo, for that introduction. And Heidi's gonna take the first slide yes, here. I will get us started tonight, thank you. So good evening, President Foster, board members, Dr. Trujillo, council, Ross, and staff. Tonight we come to you with <clears throat> an update to our implementation and PD plan for family life curriculum and the alternative curriculum. Um, I, I was gonna start and Dr. Trujillo took it right out to introduce Amanda Lee Comfer. She is our new program manager for professional development and, and she will be working with me tonight on this presentation. Next slide, please. So I want to begin by just reviewing and highlighting some aspects of the curriculum. Um, the curriculum is for students in grades 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th or 8th, and high school. Um, the curriculum is taught in 10 lessons, so each grade level has 10 lessons that is part of the curriculum. This year, um, because of various um, reasons, we have identified a couple of possible weeks that we will be um, teaching those that curriculum, either uh, May 3rd through the 14th or May 10th through the 21st. Um, schools are going to be creating their own schedules um, for that teaching of an implementation. Um, 
and also plans to ensure that all students have access to the material. All teachers that are teaching the family life curriculum or the alternative curriculum will attend a training on Wednesday, April 21st from 12 to 2.30. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda so that she can go over the superintendent's recommendations and how we have accomplished those recommendations. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so like Heidi said, um, I'm gonna be speaking to the superintendent recommendations that we had from last year and share with you some highlights for how my team has implemented those recommendations. We wanna make sure that this curriculum is executed at a very high level and that we're supporting our teachers and students um, and having a successful um, implementation. So um, you all have access to these materials, so I'm not gonna read every single detail to you, but I do want to highlight um, a few components. Um, so the, the piece I'd like to share with you on this slide is that the recommendation was to create a robust professional development plan, and I can assure you we have done that and are in the process of making it even better. Um, my team, the PD team, is working very closely with our counseling department um, to make sure that we are training all of our teachers who will be teaching both the family life curriculum as well as the alternative lessons, so that again, our students are supported and that our teachers are supported with this curriculum. Next slide, please. So you'll see here we have more recommendations and um, more information on how we have implemented those recommendations. Um, on this slide, I'd like to draw your attention to one component here. There was a recommendation to establish a school contact person at every single site for students in crisis. We know that this curriculum um, has content of a sensitive nature and that it might be triggering for some of our students. So every single school will have somebody who is um, in charge of supporting our students should the need, need arise. Next slide, please. And again, more recommendations, more information on how we have implemented them. Um, the piece I wanted to highlight here is about our public commitment to not purchase outside curriculum or any kind of curricular materials. And we have um, we have done that. This, this entire curriculum was developed in-house without the purchase of any external curriculum. Next slide, please. And the last piece here we wanted to share with you are um, the tasks that we're asking of our principals. We know they have a lot on their plate these days and my team is working diligently to make sure that we are in the background supporting them as much as we possibly can. Um, and there are some things that we need from our, our wonderful school leaders as well. So the first one is that they are identifying a point of contact for the family life curriculum. That is a person that my team will be working very closely with to make sure that all of these details are taken care of and all of our teachers and students get exactly what they need with this program. Um, the second one we've already spoken about, it's identifying a contact for students in crisis and making sure that there's an intervention protocol for those students who need that extra support. Um, we are also asking that our school leaders send the family life opt-in form and make sure they have an effective system for documenting which students will be in the alternative curriculum as well as the family life curriculum. So when the time comes, every student is where they need to be. Um, another thing we're asking of our principals is that they determine which of their staff members will be teaching the alternative curriculum versus the family life curriculum. And lastly, our school leaders will be making a schedule that um, will work for their school site for the two weeks that they will be implementing the family life curriculum. And again, my team will be working to make sure that they have sample schedules and the resources they need to make good decisions here. Heidi, is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm sorry, I was on mute. No, I think that's great, Amanda. We can open it up for questions. Thank you, Amanda. And again, welcome to TUSD. Thank you so much. Board members, any questions or comments? I just want to thank you for not dropping the ball on this one with the craziest year that we've ever had as educators. It would be an easy year to let this one slip by, right? And. And I know I had uh, a couple parents reach out a month or two ago and say, oh, so now we don't have to do this, right? And kind of like worried that this wasn't going to happen, all that we fought for. And they said, well, let me make sure we find out. And so I thank you, Dr. Trujillo, for bringing this forward so we can assure our community that that work is going forward this year. Thank you. Ms. Foster. Yes, Ms. Sedwick-Gordon. 
I'm just going to piggyback back on your thoughts and say thank you to the curriculum department. Thank you for all the work with the family and life curriculum. It's, there's a tremendous amount of work that has gone into this. And I know it was a very contentious issue. So thank you for everything and for, you know, for doing all of this work. It's really impressive. It's nice to see it all come together. Absolutely. And please have a safe and healthy holiday season. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership, Ms. Aranda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sedra. All right. Dr. Trujillo, item 9.3. Yes, item 9.3, we'll ask uh, Heidi and uh, to remain with us as well as our assistant <laughs> superintendent for curriculum and instruction, uh, Mrs. Flora Hewitt. And we wanna outline for the governing board and the community some of the measures that we are gonna ask campuses to undertake to deliver an even increasing, um, an ever increasing amount of student support. We know by some of the earlier discussions this evening, we have an unprecedented amount of students that are struggling academically. We also know that there is a portion of the district um, of parents, a portion of the district's parents that wanted on-campus learning and wanted hybrid uh, instruction to begin, primarily for the reasons of academic struggles being experienced by their kids. So I'd wanna turn it over to uh, Heidi and Flory who have uh, led a, a team uh, at the district to start talking about what could be possible and an overview of an academic support plan while students are still in remote instruction. Okay, team. All right, great. Good evening again. Um, tonight we come to you with a very important and timely topic. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the excellent work um, really that our staff, teachers, and administration have done over the last nine to 10 months. They have innovated they have adjusted consistently in order to really reach, teach, and support students and their families. Um, the struggles that we have had in Tucson Unified are not unique to TUSD. The entire nation and furthermore, um, globally, system have met, systems have met um, unprecedented challenges. Um, recently, Dr. Frey has presented information regarding learning loss and our first semester assessment data. Now that the nation has all taken first semester assessments, we have learned that our data clearly aligns with national data and the trends we're seeing across our nation. There's much to celebrate actually, as we have seen in grades three through eight, that students are maintaining their achievement in ELA. In fact, the Northwest Evaluation Association reported in their learning during COVID initial findings on students reading and math achievement and growth that in the fall of 2020, students in grades three through eight performed similarly in reading in same grade level students in the fall of 2019, but about five to cent per ten percentile points lower in mathematics. Um, this national data matches our district data shared by Dr. Freitas and in order to address potential learning losses, Tucson Unified has established an academic recovery task force. Next slide. This task uh, force was charged to develop a short and long-term academic recovery program that will focus on students who are currently not achieving mastery in academic standards. This entails a multi-layered process as this work is not simple. It involves the incredible efforts of our teachers and schools um, who are already engaged in this every day. The task force is determining the academic interventions currently in use at sites and ensuring we have a common language and set of expectations that we can use to communicate and plan together so that we as a district are able to create synergy around our academic recovery efforts. Schools are doing a great deal of, in, of intervention work, but we don't always do a great job of communicating these efforts um, to our community. The work of the task force will ensure that we have a consistent set expectations and communicate goals so that our community can be made aware efforts and we in turn can leverage the full weight of our district infrastructure to support the work cap site. Next slide. 
In order to do this, the task force will be using a multi-layered intervention approach using multiple growth data indicators. We will be using the current multi-tiered system of support to build this program. We understand that these unprecedented times present unique situations and challenges that we must account for. We also understand that data sources we have relied on previously may not be as accurate or may not even be accessible. Therefore, we must rely on new data sources to identify needs and strategies. As this plan is developed, you will see that it will address all tiers of instruction as well as multiple approaches at each tier. Next slide. As we work together um, to develop the um, program, we are committed to the achievement of every student. We acknowledge that since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the entire TUSD team has worked relentlessly to support students and families. We are using internal data from quarter one to identify learning loss and need of support. We will work as collaborative practitioners utilizing our collective knowledge, current resources, and proven research to develop the plan. We will provide our staff with identified tools, resources, and professional development uh, to provide effective supports to students. Next slide. As I mentioned previously, we are looking at a multi-layered approach, which begins now but extends through throughout the 21-22 school year. To begin, we are building upon the systems of support that schools currently have in place. We are beginning with tier two interventions during the school day. We already know the intervention programs that schools are using and the minimum times they are provided to students. We will now work to ensure schools have a common student profile for identifying who would receive these interventions and the goals for what success looks like. This will help us do a better job of tracking our interventions, communicating our work with the community, and streamlining the professional development um, we need to support teachers. In January, we will begin with Tier 3 interventions offered in multiple formats during the school day, before and after school, as well as virtual and in-person. The plan will also include our summer programs, such as our June Summer Academy and July Jumpstart. All intervention programs will be somewhat unique this year as we navigate current instructional uh, environments. The development of these programs will lead us into a clear and comprehensive system of support for the 21-22 school year. Next slide. As part of the attachments to this uh, presentation, you will find our draft targeted academic support plans. They are divided by grade level bands of K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. In the next few slides, I will share the different components of the plan. I want to clarify that the plans you have are draft and only include tier one interventions. This document will be developed further to include, include tier two as well as tier one so that we enter the 21-22 school year with a comprehensive system of support. Teams are currently developing the tier three portion of the plan. Next slide. The first section describes the goals of the academic support plan. The goals center around four critical indicators of success. Attendance, grades, quarterly benchmarks, uh, scores and high school credit current status. Next slide. For tier two interventions, we have um, developed the following criteria for student selection. This criteria varies slightly between grade level bands. So what you're seeing on the slide is a combination uh, K-12 of the different identifiers. Um, Schools will be provided a list of students based on available data that they will use to identify those based on um, other aligned data points uh, for, select, for selection criteria for two tier two interventions. So what we are providing schools is a list that then they will review and see if that is in alignment with their other um, data and what the teacher recommends to actually come up with a final list of students that are selected for tier two. 
Students, uh, next slide. Students identified for tier two intervention will be provided small group instruction during asynchronistic learning time. This is a time that the teacher has identified students are working independently on assigned tasks. The frequency and duration varies depending on the grade band, but could include three sessions per week for 30 minutes of targeted small group instruction. Targeted refers to the identification of target skills for a small group of students exhibiting the need for that skill. This type of targeted instruction is already part of the fabric of our schools. This program will surround this instruction with supports at, that will all allow us to monitor the progress of this tier two targeted small group instruction. Next slide. So these interventions will be supported through walkthrough observations by site administrators, data provided by assessment and evaluation, templates for the identification of small groups as well as sample schedules, temp scheduling templates, um, monitoring of synergy grades, gradebook to monitor grade improvement, as well as data reports on usage and student progress um, from approved platforms. Next slide. We understand that student support requires an all hands on deck approach. And we have worked on identifying the roles and responsibilities of all, um, of all from regional superintendents, curriculum and instruction, principals, teachers, as well as CSPs and MPSS facilitators. A well articulated and implemented district academic support plan will provide the most effective and efficient system for student success. Um, this concludes our presentation on academic support plans. Before I open it up for questions, I just want to thank um, Ms. Foster, Ms. Sedgwick, Gordon, and Mr. Burke for your service. It's been a pleasure. I have many memories from my time at Ochoa, um, Ms. Foster, and in the curriculum department of your support and advocacy for um, student success. So I, I appreciate um, your service. Yeah. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Board members. Ms. Grijalva. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I do think that it's in my perspective as a parent, I have two middle schoolers attending, well, I have three children attending three different schools. I have two middle schoolers attending two middle schools, and then my son is at Carrillo. And the difference I think, um, even in talking with other friends who have students, elementary age students, high school students at different schools, is the asynchronous time um, where we're, we went, we like the pendulum swung pretty significantly. So, you know, day one of this year, it was, this is not COVID school, this is regular school. And you're expected to be sitting up in uniform on camera all the time. So then we swung to the other end where it's like, you know, we're gonna let you turn off your cameras. We're gonna let you have a little more flexibility because we know it's not great for you to stare at the screen for, you know, six and a half hours a day. And we're going to um, give you asynchronous time. And so what I noticed when we switched over is my kids, the, the older two had a lot more free time. <laughs> we're, out and about. <laughs> I used to be a campus monitor, so I'm like, why are you to class? <laughs> Go back to class. Because I just felt like they had a lot of hangout time. And then I started to look at their their grades in parent view, and I'm like, oh, why didn't you turn in this assignment? Oh, well, it was asynchronous. And I was like, so that means what to you? The translation was, <laughs> I get some free time to take a breather, which I think is helpful. And and positive, but what I think would be better, and I know that um, at least one of um, one of the middle schools is going to do this next semester, is really focus on asynchronous is when I am, as your teacher, still available. You can mm -hmm. continue to work, and I'm going to monitor you. Yeah. I think more like what my, um, my fourth graders teacher does, where you have asynchronous and you're working, but she can see what you're working on and whether you're working or not. And what she does is says, um, 
So Joaquin, are you having a problem? Are, do you need any help? Because you've been on that problem for a little while. So she, so they know that someone's paying attention and is also there in case they need support, which I would rather us do more of that. And, and I think what some of the parents whose children are really struggling with online, a lot of children that are home by themselves, I mean, we're fortunate that our schedules have allowed for a parent to be here all the time. But if we weren't, I can imagine that there would be a lot of Nintendo Switch and playing and a lot of other things that have nothing to do with classwork. Um, because I, and I am concerned truly for the kids who are home by themselves or you have a middle schooler who is helping to support a lot of younger, you know, some younger siblings. How is that, how are we ensuring that the teacher is the teacher and nobody else has to be the teacher. That was one thing that my um, my son's fourth grade teacher said at the very beginning of the year. It's like I've heard from a lot of parents saying, I'm not a teacher, I don't know how to teach. She looked at all of us, it was a parent meeting, she looked at all of us and said, I am your child's teacher. I am the teacher, you were the parent. The same way that if I had a problem with your child in my classroom, I will call you when I need support, but I'm the teacher. And I, I really feel like a lot of our, the parents that are really frustrated or the children that are home alone uh, need that kind of support. And I, I do hope we go to a model that allows for more of that online support, asynchronous time, which is fine, but online support to make sure that the work is actually getting done. Yeah, I, I mean, I recall being a teacher and setting up um, individual small group instruction and, and training, having to train my first graders on how to work independently and accomplish tasks and, and do your work while I work in the, you know, with the small group. And it's that it's been a difficult transition, right, to get kids because you're not there, you know, being able to eyeball them and say, hey, I see you goofing off. I see you with your Nintendo Switch. So um, it is about building a lot of um, self-management strategies, a lot of um, SDL support needed to, so kids can build that independent, um, those independent skills. But I think the important thing is during that asynchronous time that you said something critical, it is a time when the teacher is still available, but it's also a beautiful time to provide that just right instruction to the kids, um, and that differentiated instruction to meet their needs. Other questions, thank you, Ms. Oranda. Other board member questions or comments? During call to the audience, I just, um, and we've got some emails about the grades that we're not giving grades anymore. And so when I was listening to the presentation and I, and I know there's a lot more in the agenda item that wasn't just covered in the presentation, but could you or Dr. Trujillo address that um, and, and I feel like this, this, this is just the craziest experience ever that anybody's ever had. And I think nationally we're looking at, oh, so what does this year mean, right? So we have an asterisk on every grade, like this was a COVID grade. I mean, there's, there's just so much in the, in the, about this. And I appreciate that we really need to leverage that and respect that the grade is the teacher's is is their right and responsibility and and i also don't want to i mean if we could we shouldn't even evaluate teachers right now like that's just crazy too like there i mean i i just feel so much about how do we even evaluate and if our legislature could please do something when it comes to testing you know there's so many issues mm -hmm. but it was brought forward this idea that we're not grading now and i just want to make sure that that is addressed in part of this presentation that we understand. So as I as I addressed in the superintendent's report, we're not discussing grading. We have no recommendation right now. We're not recommending changes here tonight. We're engaging leadership from TEA and Eli. I think we need to be very careful. We're addressing a multifaceted problem. We cannot paint the students that are failing classes with one broad brush. We cannot subscribe to the camp that assumes it's teenagers being lazy, refusing to do work, nor can we subscribe to the other camp that it's always the teacher's fault 
handing out an excessive workload. Uh, we have some very real factors that uh, need to be considered. We had problems with technology and Wi-Fi hotspots the first month of the school year, probably set some kids behind. And the truth is we have both categories of students. Yes, we have some students that are in their pajamas sleeping in and not logging on to Zoom classes and teachers working very hard to engage them. And yes, we could uh, have our teachers uh, work harder to understand that our young people work. They're looking after younger siblings. They have tight schedules. They're working 30, 40 hour weeks and they can't keep up with an excessive workload. So I think we have to take our time and find a multifaceted solution that works for all groups of students. And like I said, it's that balance between respecting the autonomy of a teacher to assign grades, as well as acknowledging the difficulties that our students are facing and holding them accountable accordingly. At no point though, President Foster, have we ever entertained a discussion that grades don't matter. Um, I think our discussions to this point have been specifically about Fs, not that As don't matter, Bs, Cs, or even Ds. Um, and I think we're gonna continue that discussion. We're looking forward to continuing that discussion later this week. I was talking to a high school teacher sharing that her student was driving to Phoenix for his job and attending the Zoom class at the same time. And she just said, oh my gosh, put the phone down. Oh, and I just, the stress that's on these kids and their heads that they have to be there and he had to be working. He was driving to Phoenix to go to work. It's just, I, I just recognize it. And I thank the team for, for thinking through this. And I know something that was said at Call to the Audience is, you know, have we documented it? Maybe not as best as we can. And so recognizing that everybody's coming together to document what the support looks like. So I thank you for that. And for every teacher who's going above and beyond, I really mm -hmm. hope that the time person of the year this year is a, yeah. is a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> really, really, most definitely. Please have a safe and healthy holiday. Thank you, Ms. Aranda and Ms. Hewitt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board members. It's been an honor working with, um, with the board members. I appreciate your graciousness. Thank you. All right, Dr. Trujillo, we are on item 9.5. Last item uh, of the evening that we, um, I think we delayed from the last meeting, but uh, Renee with her standard uh, budget expenditure update uh, that she gives monthly for the month of November. Ms. Weatherless. Thank you. And um, I am presenting the November expenditure update tonight. We'll go ahead and jump right into the next slide. Um, I have updated the adjusted budget for the budget revision that we um, just brought forth and approved earlier tonight. Uh, if you look at the M&O total spend, right now we are trending at $308 million. It's leaving a $13 million M&O balance, um, same for capital, off of the $22 million that was just approved. We currently have 9.3. This is something where, because we are still in distance learning, because we're still remote, there are some expenditures that we are just not incurring. And every single month we're, we're seeing this trend. So I would say come January, February, we're gonna have a much better view of where we'll end up by the end of this year. So hopefully um, that will help and might have, um, might have some help leading into uh, the budget setting for next year. Everything else is pr pretty much trending about the same. If you go ahead and go to the next slide, you'll see the breakdown of m and and capital between DSEG and non-DSEG. Um, so in the DSEG area, um, a majority of this balance that you're seeing is in the area of transportation because transportation is funded between regular m and 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 DSEG. Um, so we do have some other um, areas where we were under budget in DSEG, and so it will offset some of that savings. But and again, it's another area that we'll have to monitor um, throughout the rest of the year. Next slide, please. This is the snapshot of where our actual expenditures. So this is through November. We've spent a total of $163 million um, by funding source and by category, uh, just an informational purpose that we report on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. 
And then we get to the fund balances. So here's where we are projecting actual revenue um, that comes in and um, balancing it out with our expenses and transfers. So we had talked about this last time I presented in those cash accounts, such as tax credit, gifts and donations, um, even civic for that matter. Our campus is being closed. We aren't seeing uh, as much activity and revenue in those areas. Each month I have had to continue to trend those revenues down. We do have cash balances here. It's not an issue of us um, running out or have to fund anything. It's just one of those things that because of COVID, our revenue is not trending as we've seen in the past. Um, next slide. We'll go into the classroom spending. Uh, as I've been reporting with every every month, our instructional dollar is trending up. I think we started the first month of reporting the month of September. You saw that instructional for fiscal 21 year to date at under 50%, and it has steadily been increasing as it will continue to do throughout the year. But we are at 51.9 in year to date expenditures. We're at 69.3 in all of classroom spending, which is instruction, student support, and instructional support, um, which is very close to where we were estimated at for last year and flat to even the prior year. So I believe that that amount will also continue to trend upward. Um, on the reverse, administration is always high in the beginning of the year and will trend to go down and we're seeing that as well. And the next slide will show you just the uh, the 20 year history of that report. Um, and we won't see our as fiscal 20 and actual until the month of February. And the final slide just is a reminder of all the different types of expenditures that go into these categories. And I believe that is the end of the expenditure update if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Weatherless. What, when is the 100th day again? January? Uh, I don't have the date. Someone say, I don't have that date, the 100th mm -hmm. day. But it's it's in January, right? It's usually the end of January, yeah. January, okay. Because then we'll know what happened with the 10th day, the 40th day, and then the 100th day. We will, and we'll also see the impact of the distance learning on funding as well. Um, ADE said that we should start seeing it in our revenue reports in January. Okay. All right, questions or comments, board members? <laughs> Right. Thank you so much, Ms. Weatherless, for your, your, <clears throat> I miss seeing you. We used to go to the same gym. I'll just tell everybody. Miss <laughs> Mesa and we'd all work out together and we can't even do that anymore. I hope we can make that happen again. <laughs> Look, I'm tattling on us now. We used to, we used to work it out. <laughs> Thank so you. I miss seeing you and, um, Thank you, and please stay safe and healthy. And any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And we are on to our last item, which is future meeting dates and agenda items. When is the reorg meeting, Dr. Trujillo? Tuesday, January 5th is the next big meeting of the governing board, one item on the agenda. Well, a few items, uh, the, gov the new governing board, that's uh, when they will officially begin. The governing board will select its officers uh, for the upcoming year, and it will also uh, vote to approve the calendar of board meetings uh, for the upcoming year. And just as a gentle reminder, we had a lot of farewell activity tonight, but it should be noted that uh, President Foster, board members Sedgwick and Burke are fully on duty for the remainder of the month. Uh, and we'll be answering your emails and tending to governing board business uh, as they've committed to. So it is uh, just a goodbye for the meetings, but uh, I know I'll still be working with the three of you throughout the month as issues come up. Absolutely. Hey, just real fast before we do other ones, did anybody else get there? I wanted, I, I got, I finally got the, the gavel here. It's not nearly as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Here by myself, but <laughs> thank you, Nick, for, for delivering that. Other um, agenda items, board members? President Foster. Yes, Mr. Burke. Uh, 
I would uh, request that um, when the item that has already been forwarded to the next board for February, that is the uh, SRO advisory committee recommendations, uh, when those go to the uh, board for consideration and prior to that, uh, I request that the data and the survey results um, that were referenced in the uh, presentation we received but haven't actually been released to the public should be available to the public. I'm gonna make a, a records request for that production. And I'd just like that to be a part of what is scheduled for the February meeting so it's out there for discussion. Thank you. Other agenda items, board members. Ms. Sedwick Gordon. Uh, no, I actually, I was turning off the, the mute uh, in preparation for the end of the meeting. To tell you the truth, I had been considering um, a request to bring forward a, um, the, the consideration, uh, you know, to, for the board to consider renewing the history and social studies curriculum. It had been on my mind for the past couple of board meetings, but I think I'm going to allow the next board to, uh, to take up that issue. And for you remaining board members, you may want to keep in mind that it could probably be a, a second look, some updating. All right, thank you. All right, so we're done. We did it. Look, I made it through 2020 and- um, May 2021 be a better year. Yes. It has to be. <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. Absolutely. And just thank you again for all of our staff. I just think public school, everybody right now is just like, I mean, and I, and I, yes, our, our first responders in hospitals, absolutely, but they're trained for that. They are absolutely trained. We are not trained for this in public education and the amount of transformation and metamorphosis and growing that everybody has done for our our children in our community i just i just thank you so much i just am i'm just overwhelmed with with our teachers and our support staff and our bus drivers who are delivering food i mean everybody's just just done so much for children in this in this um unprecedented time right we hear that word all the time but it truly is and um it's been such an honor it's been the hardest thing i've ever done it's someone a former board member told me it would be like a master's degree and yeah this was like a, maybe even a doctorate to, to all of the learning and um the dead at the time and i do it all again i would absolutely do it again and so i thank you thank you dr trujillo for your leadership um mr ross all of our board staff and please Please everybody stay safe, wear your mask and um, treat everybody as, and be safe this holiday season. Thank you, happy new year and good luck new board members, you got it. Thank you, please mask up. I was in a, it was in a, a meeting today and of the testing that's happening, 24% of tests in Pima County are coming back positive. So please, it's the highest percentage and our hospitals are already overflowing. So we, we just, you, you just, good mask. We need to please mask up. Thank you. Be safe. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Uh, good night. Good night. Good night.